met a gypsy. All right, Dr. Steve Andrews is joining Gypsy Tales today, and I'm extremely excited about this podcast. Uh, for people that have never heard of you, it's probably a good thing in a way. If you've never heard of, of uh, Dr. Steve Andrews, it means you probably haven't had some kind of gnarly wrist, elbow, or shoulder injury uh, that you've had to fix. But you're actually, um, and this is my words, you are. I guess motocross industry behind the scenes royalty basically uh, there's been a lot of people that have been on this podcast or are kind of in this world that have had to come to you uh, when stuff's gone wrong so uh, yeah super excited to have you on mate it's a pleasure yeah, yeah. No, look thanks for having us and um, uh, this, I feel a bit like a fish out of water because this is very not what we do yeah yeah and uh but this is a great program to be on i love listening to the show and so it's good and and you're right i've looked down you know, i've listened to a lot of your podcasts but i've looked down the list as well and i, I know a lot of them yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, you you're very right with the um you know it's good if you haven't been to see me and yeah. you'd be surprised how many people on their last visit with me say I hope you're not offended, Doc, but I hope I never see you again. Yeah, you know, yeah, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's one of those like weird jobs, right? Where you're kind of, it's like it's bad to see you, but you're such a good dude, <laughs> and you're so good at your job. So it's like you want to see you, but not in a professional sense if you can help it. Oh, absolutely. But you, you do want, um, you want people when they come to see you to feel that. Uh, yeah, to relax, yeah. you know, and, and you do see that, and, and especially with, um, you know, so when we're seeing some of the motocross riders and things, because if they haven't seen me before, a lot of their colleagues have, or yeah. you know, guys they ride with, or you know, have seen it, and and they do relax when they come in. You can see they actually feel that yeah. they're going to be looked after, yeah. And it, it's partly how we run the rooms, but it's also they feel comfortable. They know that we know what they've been through, and yeah. and so it does change a bit. Oh, definitely. And I think uh, the there's a, anyone that, right, I mean, there'd be so many people that have listened listening to this right now that have broken bones, had surgery. Like, it's just, unfortunately, it's a pay-to-play type scenario when you're in, uh, riding motocross or any of the kind of yeah. more extreme, uh, the more extreme sports. But I think that one of the most important things when you do get hurt, even if you're not like an athlete that gets paid to ride for a living, which is like a lot of your clientele, but just having a doctor that cares enough to really want to get your injury right as good as it can be and get you back on track and I, we've all been to the emergency room where they're like oh fucking motorbikes and you know then they're doing a half bodge job on your surgery just emergency in and out kind of thing and there's a real difference between i guess being looked at as like a trauma emergency patient versus being looked at as an athlete that we've got to just get this injury as good as we can so that you don't have long-term problems and you can get back on the bike and keep doing what you love. And I think you're like a really great example of like that guy that really cares. Yeah, look, uh, we do, you know, and, and, and I do and my staff do, you know, like the, the people that work in my rooms. Um, and, and we treat it very much like you said, it's, it's just part of riding. Mm. You are going to get an injury sooner or later. How is that any different to being... Uh, footy player who's going to eventually have a knee injury or you know yeah. and it's the same thing it's just part of the sport and if you get injured you need to be treated properly and and the first question i often ask the, the riders when they come in is you know once you see what the injury is you just say to them look what are you trying to be back for yeah. like you know and and you know it might be uh, i'm not too worried about the first half of the year i want to practice for dakar the second half of the year or whatever it is yeah yeah that, that we, and we talk about a target together and, and often their targets are a little unrealistic yeah. or they're right on the edge, <laughs> yeah, but yeah. but that's what you work towards. You, yeah. you know, we try to get you back at a certain time and it's no different to any other sport. You're trying to you're trying to make the most of it and, and that's their career. Yeah. Yeah. No, so. definitely. So we'll go back a little bit to maybe your start and how you kind of got into it and then it'd be cool to... Um, yeah, talk about maybe some of the most complicated stuff that you've seen and some of the, you know, the really gnarly stuff that you've had to, like, I don't know, get creative with and just yeah. to, to, I guess, learn a little bit about surgeries and the way that, um, you know, you kind of have to go about it, maybe new technologies. I don't know. There's a, a ton of stuff that we could talk about. Yeah. But I reckon yeah. let's get some background um, on on yourself and then maybe we'll work forward from there. Um, yeah, well, background on, on how I ended up here or how we got into the motocross, no, training mate, motocross. let's go to just being a surgeon in general. Yeah, um, look, I, I 
People go into it, I think, for different reasons. I mean, I, I thought I always wanted to be a doctor. So mm-hmm. that was something I, I, I wanted to do going through school. And that was my target, you know, what I wanted to achieve. And um, and then when you get there, the way you end up in the, a particular part of medicine or a particular specialty, it, it's not... I don't think it's as programmed as most people think. Like mm. you, a lot of people don't start saying, "I want to be." I want to be an upper limb specialist. No, you you have a series of um, uh, paths where, where you've got to make a choice, where you've got to go left or right. You yeah. know, so you start and you think, um, "Okay, well, your first couple of years in a hospital, they, they'll try and rotate you around, so you do lots of different specialties." To get a feel for it, so you know, hopefully you'll work out what you want to do. Do I want to be a GP? Do I want to go down the path and be a pathologist or a radiologist? Do I want to do medicine? Do I want to do surgery, psychiatry? And hopefully, after a year or two, you know where you want yep. to head. Yeah, I was always pretty sure I wanted to do surgery, and then when what you get was the initial draw? You reckon for surgery? Yeah. Oh, look, I, I think most surgeons have a. Um, to, to get it down to its simple form, it's a it's broken, I must fix it type mentality. Yeah, okay. It's like when you get a broken bike in the workshop yeah, that's not, yeah. not running properly and you think, okay, I've got to nut this out, I've got to work out why it's not running properly and I've got to fix it. Okay. And that's very much the surgeon attitude, it broke, me fix yeah, type. Right. type. Um, and, and so I think that appeals to, you know, frustrated mechanics and things, you know, like things yeah, where yeah, you want to yeah. fix things. Yeah. And so... Um, Surgery is always very appealing in that sense. And so you go down that pathway and you go, okay, well, I'll do my surgical primary, which is, you know, obviously more study and exams. And then you've got to pick, am I going to be a general surgeon or I'm going to be an orthopedic surgeon or, you know, and you just start to, it gets narrow narrower and narrower down. and yeah. narrower as yeah. you go along. And then when you finish, um, you know, orthopedics, even probably more so than other specialties is a, you know, it's broken, I'll fix it. You come in with a broken leg, you've got to work out how you're going to, you know, make it stable and let it heal and um and then from there you then narrow down if you want to practice in a in a big city area most of the time people will sub specialize and then you start to narrow down to you know upper limb lower limb spine foot and ankle you're just going to do hands and micro and and so the, the whole thing takes a fair sort of yeah it's it's a long time yeah. and, and i'm sure if you laid it out in front of people when they start, like if you've got someone coming out of school and said, this is what you're going to have to do. It's super daunting. To get to this point, it'd be so daunting, I don't think anyone would do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But instead, it's a series of yeah. decisions as you go along and suddenly you find yourself nearly there and thinking, well, this is what I want to do. I want to treat upper limb injuries or lower limb injuries. or And, and, and you sort of get carried along by it and then suddenly you're finished and you're, and you're there treating. But the whole process takes... Oh, 15 years plus. It's yeah, 15, yeah. 16, 17 years by the time you do your medical degree. And now that's changed a bit since I was there. It was a six year. So you year. just have to do like a base medical degree first. Got to a medical degree, which in my day was mostly, most unis were undergrad and it was six years. A lot of the unis now are postgrad and, and they're a four year but three term year um, course. But you've got to have done something first. So most that's sort of six or seven years now to get through that. And then you finish that, qualify as a doctor, you become a, a resident somewhere or an intern initially. So you work trying things out in hospitals for two or three years while you work out what you want to be. And then you've then usually got to sit some sort of primary exam yep. to qualify to go down that pathway. And you, f- and you get what's called a non-training job. So you start working in that specialty, but not as an accredited trainee. And that usually happens for a couple of years. And then if you sort of tick all the boxes and they think you'll make a decent surgeon or a decent psychiatrist or whatever it might be you're training for, yep. then you move on to the training scheme and then that's usually about a four-year program depending on what you're doing. And at the end of that, you sit your final exams and that, that qualifies you as that sort of surgeon. And then post that, you, you then decide if you want to subspecialise, you can go and do further training and that's what they call fellowship years so yeah okay and 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 i spent another three years after that going and doing um hand and micro surgery um elbow fellowship shoulder fellowships and upper limb fellowships so wow. it was about another three years i finished quite early so it had there wasn't a lot of time pressure i could actually spend a bit more time um honing down on what i wanted to do and then came back to brisbane and by then, I had one child and a, and Sal, well, my wife. I don't, you've obviously yeah, yeah, with yeah, Sal, yeah, yeah. and um, and then it's time to start working. So, 
and uh, it's a it's a fair road. And as I said, I think if you if you um, put it all in front, it would be daunting. Yeah, you know. But it's it's done in stages. And each stage, you've got a choice to make. Do I get off here or do I keep going? And yeah, yeah. do I go left or right? And eventually, you find yourself right out on the limb of the tree doing something very narrow. Yeah, you yeah. Know? So a lot of patients come in, they say, oh, can you have a look at this for me? I say, look, I can have a look, but I haven't seen anything like that for... Yeah, you just work in such yeah. a specialty kind of area. It's, it's, it's very narrow, yeah. Like I even get like patients that I've operated on, that say, their shoulder and they're happy. They say, oh, can you do my knee replacement? I say, no. Yeah, I... I I've done knee replacements, but not this century. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, you yeah. know, I'm the, I'm, the, I'm the wrong side of 50 now and it's been, you know, 20 years plus since I've done something like that. You don't want me to do it. Yeah. But I'll recommend some good guys to you. So is it the uh, kind of thing too where you're always learning? Because I can imagine that there's probably not a point where the knowledge kind of stops, even though you've got all of the qualifications up to wazoo, but you'd still be learning new, like, t- surgical techniques or... Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it does. It keeps going. There's always learning. There's always new products out there that yeah. we're trying. And, um, you know, we, we actually do a little bit of that sort of stuff where we um, have adopted a few sort of things uh, that are probably on the, the newer end of uh, things like biological pro- um products and things implants yeah right. collagen patches and um injecting tenocytes into degenerate tendons it's a bit like stem cell yeah, injection okay. type thing so we do a fair bit of that um using um you know some of the materials we use are sort of uh you know new things will come along like pyrocarbon pyrocarbon's been around a while but not necessarily in the uses that we use it for and so it's an interesting material it's um uh, it's it's more amenable to lubrication and and it's more wettable and it forms boundary lubrication unlike metal prostheses so they form really good so what would the application be of this so? oh joint replacements in younger patients you know okay. where, where they've got a long time way to go and will often replace um, part of their joint with a, a hemi after replacing it we've actually done that in a couple of the motocross riders that have had destroyed shoulders and we've really put, we've you know they've retired and finished their career and then they come and see and go can anything be done about this and and we've replaced them and then um they, they some have actually gone back to riding which does worry me slightly because these, <laughs> these processes are a little bit brittle but the, um you know it's just uh the new avenues the new materials new yeah. ways we can use them um, pyrocarbon is an interesting um, substance because it's actually made out of um, graphite, which is a, obviously a two-dimensional carbon latticework. Yeah, yeah. And they, they fire it in a kiln and the outside ends up heading towards a three-dimensional carbon latticework, which is obviously what diamond is. Yeah, yeah. And so the surface ends up sort of somewhere in between. And so how does, what is it, oh, we could we could look that up, Griff. So how would you, what would you type Py- in? Oh, pyrocarbon or pyrolytic carbon. Type that into the Google thing there. How would you spell it? Uh, it's just P-Y-R-O carbon, C-A-R-B-O-N. See if they've got something oh, there. P-Y-R-O. Py- carbon, yeah. Griff, P Y R O. There you go. See if there's And then prosthesis. Yeah, there from, you go. Yeah, right. Oh, so that's like a you'd use that as like a ball, like to like a humorous, to replace a humeral head. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. And uh, so it's an interesting. It, it's it's great advantages. It lubricates better than uh, than a metal prosthesis, so it's less likely to cause wear. So for yeah, a young okay. patient. So, yeah, there's always things like this coming along that you can try and find the right patient for them. And so it never really stops. You're right. It, you just keep learning and trying. Um, when you get to that point where you don't want to advance anymore, you're probably approaching the end of your career. Yeah, And, it, and it's yeah. time to sort of tail off and say, I've, I've done mine and, and I'm out. So Yeah. But uh, I'm a little bit off that yet. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it's a, it's a crazy road. Uh, and I guess that's why there's not that many specialist like it's very it's like a i guess a crazy career to you start general and it's just this process over you know 15 or 20 years of just like honing in to to be almost at like the tip of the spear in a sense and there's not i guess that many professions where i guess it's that long and you end up being like you said so far out on that branch yeah absolutely yeah It, it, it is a fairly unique sort of position like that i think and um uh, you do. You end up very narrow at the end, where you know your skill set 
you just unless you make a point of staying broad, you know, yep. like general practitioners obviously have to know a lot about yep. a lot of things. We know a lot about a very narrow field, you know, and it's um, it, it does make it. Uh, uh, I think it makes it easier, not harder. Cause, yeah, Because yeah. when patients come to you, um, you're not expected to to be able to you know look after their other needs. You, you're really there to focus and fix a problem for them, and it's and it's easier. And you're often the last port of call, you know. Yeah. They, you know, so um, they're not saying, "Oh, what else could be done if I went somewhere else?" They, they're here for you to treat them. Yeah. And in some ways, that's a lot easier, I think. So what what do you think drew you to being a uh, upper limbs specialist? Was it kind of just you kind of get to the forks in the road and you just kind of make the choices, or was there something that drew you to that? No, I think I think that's all it is. You get you get to a fork in the road and you think, what have I enjoyed most? And and it's usually well for me, it was upper limb surgery. There's um, there's often a bit more variety in upper limb, like a, you know if you become a knee surgeon yeah okay. they, they do a lot of scopes and a lot of knee replacements and upper limbs a bit more varied um and i think that appealed to me but um it's it's really just whatever you've enjoyed the most as you've gone through and and where you think you can make the biggest difference yeah, I suppose. yeah yeah okay and is there like creativity that comes into it do you think and uh because yeah it's not i guess that whenever you're dealing with the human body i'm sure it's not like every patient would be different and you'd have to be creative and you'd have to think about outside the box. Yeah, you, you, you do from time to time. Um, you, you know, they often say there's the bit of the, there's the science, but there's also the art in doing it. And, yep. and what they're meaning there is that you, you've, you've just got to adapt and, and find a way to fix something sometimes. You might, um, you know, there, there isn't necessarily um, a, a prefabbed, implant to fix every problem and at times you have to look at a fracture or whatever it is you're dealing with and just find a way to make it work you know you've got you, you order what you think you're going to need and you often order too much and say yeah. you know we'll have these sets there in case i need them and when you open up you've just got to find a way to get it together and make it work and and that's where the you know so-called artwork uh, yeah. comes into it you know the the, the, it's it's yes there's a level of science and training behind it occasionally you you, the, you just have times where you've got a you know the art of surgery and they call it so yeah just to get it right yeah so. yeah no it's so cool so what i guess in do you have is there i guess something in like a person's personality or um yeah yeah i guess personality would be the word but where you think it just like lends to going through that process that you described do you have to enjoy studying do you have to like what do you have to enjoy to be you after yeah. that whole period of time you know i i don't think you have to enjoy study i don't think there's many people around that truly enjoy studying not yeah. when you're studying for an exam anyway and there's yeah. pressure on you no one likes that um well maybe odd person but they're, they're a bit odd yeah, um, yeah. but you got to be Look, for medicine, there's nothing in medicine that's actually that hard going through. It's not like being, um, you know, uh, doing physics or engineering or mathematics or something at uni where you've got to understand something and use it so much. Medicine's probably more about having a decent memory and practicing a lot. Hmm. And so, because none of what we learn is all that difficult, there's just a lot of it. Yeah, okay. So you've got to be prepared to sit down and read it and, and almost memorise textbooks and things to, yeah, to, right. to sit. So, um, you know, like when you do your surgical primary, there's literally three textbooks and they go, you know, you've got an anatomy and a pathology you and a physiology. You need to read them and memorise them. And you do. you just got to go and spend the time really? to read it and memorise it. And, and what did that look like for you? Oh, lots of nights just reading it. Yeah, really? I, I've always had a good memory, so yeah. that, that made it easier. Um, you know, but uh, you just got to do put the time in. If you don't, if you don't read it, you don't memorize it, you don't pass. Yeah, okay. So it's it's nothing in it's that difficult. It's just memory work, really. And then the art of you know what you're going to do is about practice. You yeah. know, and and that's probably applies to most specialties. Yeah maybe surgery more than the others but you've just got to have done the procedures and learned how to do them and so that you can actually do them properly that, you know? it's it's crazy because you would think that it, it would be so hard and uh it makes sense the way you just said you you don't have to understand things in a sense in the way that you do with like physics or or mathematics or i'm sure even like coding and and stuff like that um but i feel like when you say i'm a surgeon to somebody there's a certain aura 
that comes around that to just a lay person that would think like oh my god how could you do that yeah, yeah. If you want to, if you want to bring it back to earth, you talk to your family about it. And I, yeah. Like I, I said to, um, I said to my youngest son last night. I said, "Oh, I'm going, I'm going on Gypsy Tales tomorrow." You know. Yeah. Whispering his ear, he goes, "Oh, great! It'll be known as Gypsy Fails now." <laughs> <laughs> so they, they, they don't see it. In, you know, they, your dad, and and um, you know what you do is you, your job, and you just want to do it well. Yeah. You know, and and I don't think it's really that different to any other small business or profession really yeah. you, you're there yes you've you put a lot into the training but you, you're there and you want to do a really good job and you want to treat people properly so they come out the other end and and uh, have a good result and the patient that says thanks doc i never want to see you again that's that's, that's a good thing it's great yeah yeah it is great yeah and that's and that we get a real buzz out of that and uh like a lot of the motocross boys, um, when they come through, you know they'll they'll bring you a jersey and sign yeah, it and yeah, say thanks, yeah. Doc. And say so, um, if if you're ever in the rooms, you'll, you'll say we've just got stuff up everywhere, you know, from the guys. Yeah, that well, have brought I, in I, so. I came in with uh, with Jats one time when Jats oh, had his. Yeah. I think it was when he got his shoulder done. There was, um, I mean, you'd probably remember better than me. Um, but yeah, I remember going in the the waiting room, and there's helmets everywhere, and then all the jerseys from from everyone. Yeah, um, it's cool. To and we change them around a bit, yeah. we move them, and yeah, 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 it's just it's it's yeah, it's a bit of fun. Yeah, it's nice. It's a nice thank you. Yeah, yeah. So because we we we're in a bit of a different industry, really, in that um, there's guidelines on what we can do with advertising and things like yeah, we, we right. you know you, advertisers very much shunned um social media shunned really um, yeah yeah it is and what, uh, what's that what would be well, the reason there well the problem is that they don't um it, it's considered unethical to try and create a market so you don't want to mm. be selling something out in the market and say patient saying i want that when mm. they don't need it mm. and that's considered unethical and so so the, would that be more? Would would that be super applicable in your specific profession though? Because uh, like, I mean, it's not like oh, I want my polycarbon shoulder. I'm going to go and oh, break no, my shoulder. But then again, there probably is those weird people out there that have the like hype, you know, severe hypochondria where they think something's wrong when it's not in a sense. Yeah, there, there's always been tight restrictions on on what you do as a doctor as far as let's call it advertising it's not really promotion let's mm. call it promotion and um it, it's it's i think they're having a bit of trouble adapting it to new world yeah and, and look i'm i'm no i'm the wrong side of 50 and i'm no expert with social media wayne will tell you that i'm, yeah. I'm very much the novice and we've only um really started even having an instagram page recently because we were basically told that you know younger people don't use your website; they want an Instagram page, and mm. so we've started that, and we've tried to match it and make it look very much like a website uh, instead of yeah, it's yeah, a it's yeah. a more professional site. You know, yeah. it's not shots of me having smashed Abo for brekkie. It's, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's you know some patients that have come through. It's often some you know information about the practice, what to expect. It's just trying to get a look and a feel similar to the practice and to the website. Yeah. Um, but the, like the restrictions, and not everyone follows them properly. But like even if you you know say I operate on you and we you, you put a comment you know on on a photo or something from the from the my Instagram page, if you write anything positive about us, that's regarded as an endorsement, and we can't put that up. That's bizarre. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's kind of weird. To be honest. It, it, it is weird when you're in an industry where. Um, the government's position on it really is that patients should be able to decide who they want to go and treat them. Yeah. Yet you're not allowed to do anything to sort of show yeah. them why you think you can do yeah. a good job for them. Yeah, yeah. Because there is a difference between a good surgeon and a great surgeon or a good surgeon and a bad surgeon. And, you know, you kind of would want uh, some information to help decide on which one's which. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And we can't promote use of a particular product. We can't we can't put any endorsement out there. Or well, we're not meant to. Some surgeons do, but yeah. you're not really meant to put any endorsement out into the into that space, you know, for people to see. You can basically say what you do, but traditionally the rest of it's meant to be essentially word of mouth. Yeah. You know? yeah and yeah. um you can educate, but you can't 
promote if that's yeah. right you know does that make sense yeah, so, yeah 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 so so recently like we we actually haven't had our instagram um site for very long but we've actually had to turn the comments part of it off because it's lovely we get lots of really great feedback on it people put on the oh thanks doc that's feel crazy. great you can't put it up wow yeah, yeah. that's a that's a super weird uh you, you just that seems counterintuitive because it does to want, me too yeah you'd want yeah. to make a decision i guess for like plastic surgery and stuff like that you could like there's definitely some places where i could see that it could get like a into a bit yeah. of a weird world when you're doing like brazilian butt lifts and shit like that but it's just not well, really what you're doing well they'll, they'll often put or a before no. and after photo <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. I, I stay away from the butt lift um, <laughs> they'll, they'll oh, the plastic sides often put a before and after photo um, but if they then get like a comment from the, that patient yeah. saying, you know, love my butt lift, they're not meant to put that up. So, you know, or leave it attached. They're meant to actually take all that down. So so, so word of mouth is really then your well, biggest kind that's, of... That's been traditionally the way, way medicine works and they tr- uh, the guidelines are trying to keep it that way. Yeah. You know, what, what, what I guess they, they don't want is they don't want a surgeon going out there and... and um, just plastering i'm the best surgeon in the country when yeah. when it's just him saying it yeah, you know? yeah and that's what they're trying to get away from yeah because some people will be influenced by that yeah and well I, I definitely think that word of mouth is probably still if you are in business in any business um i guess maybe the internet stuff's a little bit different but i honestly yeah. think word of mouth and still i think this podcast the way that it kind of got uh, the traction that it did early on is just like good old fashioned um, word of mouth and people saying, "Oh, you got to listen to this. You got to listen to this." So it's kind of, I mean, it's still a pretty pre- prevalent uh, form of advertising. It, it is still very powerful, yeah. And and that's where we've got. I mean, we're trying to keep abreast of technology, and 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 but um, oh, I'm sure the vast majority of my patients over the years have been word of mouth, and certainly in the motorcycle industry, mm. most people have have come because you know they walk in so oh i'm mates with and you yeah. fixed his shoulder last year you know yeah. or fixed his elbow or whatever it might be and so it, it is a big part of of way we get business is, yeah. is is that um i've had two patients in the last week come and said i heard about you on gypsy tales really <laughs> so, yeah. no way that's crazy yeah and, well, and so that really that's word of mouth too yeah it's, exactly it's, you know you've got um you know someone like um chucky in here and, yeah. and saying you know nice I can't things believe, and, have you seen him riding recently yeah it scares me a little bit but <laughs> me too i'm like bro you just got told you're allowed to ride yeah yeah and um and that's and that's where social media comes in too i, I can see i'm looking going yeah well daniel's riding again yeah <laughs> tick, tick, tick. i don't know brother <laughs> that's so good yeah um, it's good to see him doing well though so. it is good to see him yeah. doing well he's a good dude yeah. so um we'll talk about his surgery pro- a bit later on i reckon yeah. but um Wow, what was I just for everyone out there, look, we probably will talk oh, about a few yeah, people yeah, yeah. here. We should say that actually. Um, and, and look, it's not normally ethical for us to discuss somebody you haven't okayed it with because we, you know you obviously can't do that. But there are a few patients that um, Jason and I have yep. discussed that we, you've um, already spoken to them and they've given us their yep. their permission to actually talk about their surgeries or their injuries yep. and things. So I was going to put a disclaimer to it at the very start of the yeah, podcast right. and say yeah. that yeah, because. Uh, yeah, it's it's interesting. It's cool. Like you don't really get a chance to, I guess, hear about surgeries and some of the injuries and uh, and things like that um, because there is like that confidentiality. But the boys have been cool enough to to let you um, go through some of the stuff that you know has kind of gone on. Um, I think one of the interesting things, just to go back to the advertising stuff, is there's like a finite amount of patients that you can treat at any you know any given week and you've actually got a reputation as like a bit of a beast when it comes to surgeries i mean i don't know like you can do up to like 12 in a day sometimes or like how many surgeries like you're you're known as a guy that's just like gets in and can really smash some shit out which is pretty crazy to think about yeah, you, look, part of doing it well, you got to have the right team around you. Yeah. And, and and it's great for me to say, oh, yeah, we'll do a big day. But if, if you haven't got the right people around you, a big day turns into an unpleasant day. Yeah. Whereas um, the right team, you know, you've got the right nursing staff and, the, and, and you know, your normal scrub team, your normal assistant, your know, anaesthetist who's trying to push along and, and work efficiently as well. It makes a massive difference. And so if you can get the right team around you, you can actually – 
you don't you don't actually operate any quicker. You just do the same thing. What you cut out is all the dead time. Yeah, right. And then you get through a lot of work. You know, so um, you, you can actually be really productive. It's like any anything. If you cut out all it's the processes, just processes, it's processes. Process. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And then you can be really efficient, and you can do everything properly, and have a great day doing it because it's enjoyable, and you and you you've, you've got everything running smoothly, and yeah. you, you look back at the day when you finish, and you go, "We've done some really good work here." You know, it's it's these patients are going to go great. Yeah. So, what's a big day look like uh, for you, or like what's a a really uh Oh, look, a normal operating day for us is probably about, um, well, it's, it's probably between about 12 and 14 hours yep. in theatre. Um, in theatre. Yeah. Wow. And so, and I do that Mondays, Wednesdays and, uh, sorry, I do it Wednesdays, Fridays and so, the occasional Monday, like I do about one in four, two in four Mondays. Um, and, and look, the, the, the number of cases you get, on obviously depends what they are. Some cases take half an hour and you can do lots of them. Other cases might take you all day. Really, you know, so um, yeah, so it is variable, but yeah, we can get through a lot of work, and and we'll tend to, especially for the the athletes and things that are coming through, they're on a time schedule. We'll often just say, look, look we'll just do it tomorrow. We'll yep. just put you on and get it done, and um, and, and uh, the quicker you get it done, the quicker they get back. So, um, you know, most days we probably do. Oh, I suppose the average would be between about eight and ten surgeries, and on people of mixture of things some are elective some are trauma yep so and that's a couple of times a week that's pretty crazy i mean i i think about the what was like the first operation that you did before we keep going on just that uh that feeling you must have felt of like cutting into a human with a scalpel for the first time and then like just going fuck i'm actually gonna do this whole thing by myself like was that a pretty gnarly feeling um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, it is, and and it become it comes in stages, and it's 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 less perceptible than you would think. In that, you know, if you're really keen on surgery, when you're a resident, you'll go to theatre and try and do as many assist for as many cases as you can. Oh, uh, yeah. And, and, and so you're getting a bit of exposure. Yeah, and then the boss will say to you, "Look, why don't you start this operation?" And you know, you might do the incision. Might be all you do is just cut the skin, yep. but you know, you, you, you've yes, you've done a little bit of an operation, and then the next time you're there, the boss says, "Well, you did that pretty well last time. How about you actually do the operation this time, and I'll help you with it." And it, it, it isn't so much of a on-off. Yeah, it's not like skydiving, right? No, where you're, <laughs> where either, you're, like, you're at some point you just leap yeah, out of the plane. Yeah, yeah. It's not normally like That's that. That's how I picture it, like standing there with like a scalpel, just being like, "Oh, look!" I always think in the this context would be like a tattoo artist. Like doing yeah. their first tattoo and, you know, you see so many tattoo artists where their first tattoo is just like the biggest piece of shit in the world. <laughs> it's like I'm wondering if that's what it's like for a surgeon. No, look, it shouldn't be. It possibly yeah. is for the odd trainee depending on where you are and, yeah. and that's what they're trying to get away from. I yeah. think that they, they're, they're very keen on tra training programs to have the, the trainees heavily supervised. Um, and that's about that easy transition, you know. And even now, I, 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 I've recently left the public again i've been there and out and back in and back out and when you're at the public um system and you've got a lot of the people that are trying to learn there you know you've got registrars and fellows and and um the best way to to teach them when they're at that level where they're already pretty experienced is to say look you you decide what it is you want to learn and um sometimes we'll even take them to the private and i'll get them to assist me doing one um, and then you'll go back to the public and you say okay well you do the next one and I'll I'll be outside yep. and and let them not struggle is not the word but let them work out what's really not easy out, yeah yeah and then um, often it's good then to help them with one and then you know, the next one you might say oh, I'll be in the tea room yeah yeah you know and and you just wander in at the key moments and say how are you going with that you know and and it, there are nice ways of teaching and learning without being that huge amount of uh you know that massive pressure of this is your first tattoo yeah make yeah. it a good one yeah you know yeah, so yeah. and that's why it should work and that's why it works most of the time so yeah. it wasn't just uh they don't ideally they don't just drop you in the deep end yeah, yeah. okay yeah, yeah that's what i imagine it's just like you pass some tests and it's like righto mate you're good to go you've got a broken femur 
in you get go for it bring yeah. it where's your hammer where's, where's your makita well let's go for it yeah no it's 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 hopefully not like that for most people yeah, yeah okay yeah. yeah i think if it was but people would leave i think you know they, yeah. they'd be very daunting for a lot of people and they'd just say oh this is you know this you're making this me. whole surgery thing sound a lot easier than what i thought it was yeah it's not um no, do you no, think there's a misconception in a way uh Oh, I just think it's about training. If you train to do something, it's it's like if you put me on a motorbike, yeah, mate, I'd make it look very difficult. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm yeah. not I'm not a great rider, and uh, they asked me to go in. I can relate. Oh, <laughs> mate, it's chalk and cheese between you and I. <laughs> the um, they, they asked me one year to go in the charity ride. You know that scooter race they have at Pimpama once a year, and is it like a 24 hour one or something? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. They asked me to go in that one year because. Um, race safe had put a team it was the first year they had it actually i think they said oh doc come and you know come and ride yeah and i said to them, like i'll end up back in my theater oh it's exactly what i said yeah. i said you have no idea how bad i am on a bike <laughs> this is not for me and um but i went down and watched and they'd replaced me with stephen gall so i think they got the better end of the deal yeah, you know? that was the so, move, wasn't it? yeah definitely <laughs> so um you know and it would it's the same sort of thing it's a, you put me on a motorbike and just go ride like right over this motocross it would be a disaster so it's um it, it's all uh it's what you train to do if you if you train to ride a bike all the time you yeah. get really good at it yeah especially if you've got good mentors teaching you and you know i, know, I notice on a few of your podcasts you know that a lot of the riders say oh i went and got some lessons with ben townley or yeah, you know yeah you know ben's a lovely guy you know and he he um yeah he, if you got the right teachers in your practice, you get good at it. Yeah, no, and and, it and I think surgery is exactly the same. If you've got the right people who showing you the right mentors and teacher going through your practice, you get good at it. Yeah, yeah, no, it makes sense. So, what's a team look like? Because you're so right about the processes thing, and I mean, even I tell people <coughs> that you know, whenever we talk about this business, speaking of Ben, I was actually with Ben all weekend. We were in yeah, Perth right. together. Um, race and manage him up and um, we we did one day on the Saturday where we just drove around to like wineries and breweries and just drank wine and ate food all day and um, we were really talking about like the meta of the business yeah. and um, he couldn't believe the detail and all the different things that we do but it's the very same thing like we just work on processes like right after this is done Griff knows exactly what to do and then it goes you know it goes over here it goes here I do this they do that and you're right it's sort of it just kind of the better you get with the processes the the smoother everything gets the more work you can put out so it makes sense that it's the same in that um in that surgical environment but what does your team look like uh, in theatre or in in the rooms or both? Just but yeah, that, yeah, just how it's sort of set up. Um, look, our rooms run very well. I've I've got the best staff I've ever had at the moment, and they, and they that's really awesome. are. Yeah, look, they really are terrific, and and that's part of the reason, like the patients and the riders relax when they come in because it's not just me. Like yeah, yeah. Um, like to give you an extreme example, like like you've liaised with Sal, my, my yeah, wife. Yeah. Or, Sal's got a very interesting skill set. She was a nurse originally, and then she um, she's done a law degree and been a medical defence lawyer. Wow. And she's done a, an MBA. So and she's a, got a very broad set of skills. Really broad set of skills that apply to all well, medical practice, essentially, yeah, yeah. and not just the medicine of it, but the running the practice side Behind of it. Behind every great man. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, um, like, the writers all know Sal. Yeah. And they'll often ring her rather than ring me. You know, because they feel really comfortable ringing her, and and they probably think I'm in theatre half the time, and yeah. and so, um, well, they'll just ring her, you know, and and she'll the phone will go, and she'll pick it up, and it'll be one of the riders, and they go, oh Sal, um, I've broken my leg, Ugh. and she says, oh, well, okay, where are you? And they go, turn four, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what? You're still on the track, yeah, and they'll feel a blap going past, and no way, Sal will go, have you rung the ambulance? Not yet. How about, how about you do that first? <laughs> yeah, 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 that's classic. And, and so they feel comfortable with, with the people I've got in the rooms, you yeah, know. So, yeah. um, you know, sales so obviously a big part of that, but but they feel comfortable just walking in and talking to the you know, the receptionist and the practice nurse and, um, you know, they'll, they'll talk to Wayne and, you know, there's heaps of people there that they feel comfortable with. And, and you've got to have that team, you know, because I, 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 to be efficient, you've got to, not do all the bits you're not 
not great yeah, at you yeah, know 100%. so mate, there's no point me doing typing i'm a one finger typer so i'm yeah. lucky if i can get the second finger involved yeah so there's no point me doing my own typing there's no point me doing my own organizing i see patients i talk to them i sort them out and then we try and fix them you know yeah. and that's and that's really it so you've got to have the right team around you and then it's the same thing when you go to theater you've got to have you know an anesthetist that's um used to doing that sort of work otherwise it's the turnovers are very slow. Yeah, you've got to have um, so good your, assistance. So your timing. So you get an anesthetist. That's like the hardest word in the English language yeah. to say, I reckon. And uh, you then have that. So you'd have like your schedule. So let's say you've got ten yeah. patients. You might in have a list day, with ten on, and, and then and you know how long each one should take. So the anesthetist is yep. going to basically time out when they're going to put people to sleep, so that you're just rolling from like one person to the other. Oh, is that sort of how it works? Look. Yes, or, sort of in an ideal world, yes. In in the reality, it's not so easy because um, you you usually work out of one theatre, and mm. so. But what they are caught doing is looking at how you're going. You know, they know the operations as well as you do. They're they're calling for the next patient to come down to be ready in the anaesthetic bay. They can get a drip in, and so they're ready to roll for the next patient. You've got the nurses that are managing all the equipment and scrubbing and prepping, driving, handing all the gear. If you if you've got one or two cogs in it that are not or familiar with it, yeah. boy, it slows down. Yeah, yeah. So so you just go the right team. Yeah. That's crazy. How long did it take to kind of assemble uh, the crew that you've got now? Because I'm sure over the years it just gets better and better and better and better. Yeah, look, it has done. And, and it, it's great when really good people stay. Yeah. You know? And that's like any business. If you get good people and they stay, your business runs well. If How do you, you constantly get good people turn to around, stay? Oh, well, I, you give them an environment I think they enjoy working in. Yeah. I, I think. I think that's the key to it. I mean, uh, I think so. it is hard. Because oh, talented is. people uh, will, well, you know, keep kind of progressing forward. So it's like, how do you, yeah, how do you keep good people when you yeah, get them? Yeah, it's, it's, um, I think you've got to keep them happy so they're enjoying what they're doing and they're engaged and they feel like they're making a difference. Yeah, yeah. Um, and because um, they do, you, you just, I think you've got to try and let them know that they do, yeah, you know. Yeah. So, um, and, but there'll always be people move on, you know, partners move away or, you know, and, and um, or or you know, they get offered a bit of something somewhere else, or they're retiring, or yeah. they're going to have a baby, or you know, whatever it is. So there'll be people move on at times, but generally speaking, um, we've been lucky. Probably that's the you know the harder you work, the luckier you get. But we've been yeah. lucky to be able to build a really good team over time. So uh, it just helps enormously. Yeah, yeah. You can get through so much more work when you got the right people around you. No, definitely. Speaking of uh, uh, the anaesthetic side of things, have you ever had anyone wake up during a surgery? No. You occasionally have people that move a bit during surgery, and that's really? usually about well, that's usually about timing of them. You know, you, you don't want um, the anaesthetic's got to wear off to a degree, yeah, and you want them to wake up just after you've finished, yeah, and and sometimes they start to move just before you finished. Uh, and you say you just need a little bit give more little, there, thanks. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. they just give them a little tiny bit more the, anaesthetic. Uh, so. The anaesthetist is in the room the entire time through all surgeries, right? Pretty much in yeah. in Australia, anyway. Yeah. Oh, they might go outside to see the next patient, but yeah. they're, they're three feet away. Yeah, but they're um, right there. They're right there. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes overseas, they'll have um, in other countries they'll have one anaesthetist oversee a couple of theatres, or you yeah, know, it's not quite so one to one. Australia, the practice has always been sort of you know gold standard, which is and he's there for the whole time. So. Yeah. Josh, uh, I don't know if you've heard of Josh Hill, um, motocross, supercross yeah. rider. Yeah, yeah, so he broke his hip, um, or had his hip dislocated, and then he broke something recently in supercross, and he woke up while they were drilling. In re This is really recently. Fully yeah, right. woke up and was, like, screaming at the guy. And they were, I think they were just, like, drilling in the last one or two screws um, into his... I can't remember exactly what he said, but I think they were like drilling into him because they couldn't pop the thing in. So they needed to like drill into his bone to like pull the, um, pull it back or something like that. Yeah. And then he woke up and then the, in, the guy just like kept going and he was like, stop, stop, stop. And the guy just like didn't give a fuck and didn't stop and just kept going. And uh, he said it only lasted like another two or three minutes, but he was just laying there just freaking out. Yeah. Now, look, so, sometimes I obviously don't know what happened to him, but the, yeah. the, um, 
sometimes you get patients who come in and they say, oh, look, last last operation I had, I was, uh, I woke up. And, uh, that and is my nightmare. Oh, and you go and look at the chart though and they, and they had local anaesthetic. Like they were meant to be awake. It's just that they snoozed off they for half an hour and then woke really? up and they go, I shouldn't be awake. You go, no, you're meant to be awake. It's you've had wow. a, you've had a local anaesthetic or a spinal or whatever it is. So so not sometimes the problem is the lack of the explanation about what's yeah, what they've what had. That actually was not, supposed to not, go not, not a failure in the anaesthetic, you know. But people do wake up from time to time. That's what the everyone tries to avoid. Yeah. Because you know, so, yeah. Uh, there's different types of um where you can what's it called like locked in syndromes almost where um you have like an anesthetic and like your body stays essentially paralyzed but yeah. you can actually wake up and people can like see and hear everything yeah um, but they're completely I, like paralyzed look I, i'll horrify all an east out there now talking about anesthetics and i'll say you know nothing about anesthetics because that's not in my narrow field yeah okay but there are different components to an anesthetic in, yeah. that, in that you you know you want analgesia so that you want the patient to be not feeling pain you you may want them asleep or awake you may um you, you, you may want them paralyzed yeah and so the the horrific ones that people talk about are the ones where the patient's paralyzed but can feel pain yeah. and is aware oh. and that and that's that's the horrible one that everyone yeah. tries to avoid because have you heard stories of it oh everyone's heard stories but i've never seen it yeah okay but, but it can happen i wonder and, how common it is It'd be uh, uncommon, but uh, it's got to be uncommon, and it and it's. Oh, I think it's probably most anaesthetists' worst nightmare. So they, they're very conscious of not letting that happen. Oh, um, but whole... if you've, if you've got the those the, you know the paralysed drugs on, so you can't say anything. Yeah. But you you haven't got enough analgesia, and you haven't got enough sedation, so you're awake and conscious. You're feeling pain, and you can't say anything. That's that's the horror one. Do you ever think about this? Is to go on a little bit of a tangent. Do you ever think about consciousness just in general, like the fact that we're having a conscious experience, and then that there is a mystery around that in science? Like we don't know what consciousness is, or how it propagates, or what you know the properties of it are. We've just we're conscious, but we know how to make ourselves unconscious. And I mean, when we go to sleep, there's periods where we're completely unconscious. Um, and then that's in like deep sleep. And then you get into REM sleep where there is an element of consciousness that is going on. And then that's when you end up dreaming. Um, but it's like, we don't even understand this thing that is consciousness, but we actually do understand how to completely stop it for surgeries and, and things like hmm. that it's a crazy like phenomenon that i guess we just don't really think that much about in our daily life no i think uh, look i i don't that's not something i do but the the uh, i think the consciousness part of it was was i think people always thought that was part of self-awareness like yeah. you, you know you, you you're aware that you're a per and, and your person your place what you're doing yeah but now they've got computers that it can be self-aware I'm not sure where that goes. I, 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 don't, I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, it's uh, it's been something that um, I've been super into for probably like the last five years in, I guess, uh, like a Buddhist framework. Um, yeah. And it, I guess I came into it through philosophy with a lot of like the Greek, you know, Stoic philosophers. And then it, it led me um, to read a book by Joe Dispenza called Breaking the Habit of Being Yourself. And it, I didn't, en I didn't enjoy it. It was kind of weird. Like I, I read through a little bit of it and then it, it started good and then stopped making a lot of sense. It got very metaphysical and I was like, oh, well, we, that's pointless in a sense. Cause by definition, you almost can't understand metaphysics in a way. Um, but then it led me to a book by Sam Harris called Waking Up. And then that's what got me into, I guess, like the more Buddhist sort of side mm -hmm. of things. And then that's from thousands and thousands of years ago. And then to your point with like computational theory um, and a lot of the computer sciences that are, um, that are kind of like the leading edge right now, that question around self-awareness, the concept of self, what consciousness is. And I, there's, I guess, theories in computation where consciousness is just a control model for attention, but then as a byproduct of that, so it's just a complete, like almost like a software state that's uh, in a physical substrate of like the human brain, I guess. Um, and that basically this feeling, like the fact that we have phenomenal content, you know, of our experience, um, it's just like this weird side effect of this process that's like running on the brain, but that's what it is to be 
like human you know so there's some really crazy stuff that that's going on in in that uh in that whole lane at the moment and you think about it all the time like damn that's the thing that like makes us human is this consciousness and like you said that self-awareness and the more and more science that's been you know developed in that area it just seems like it's just this random side effect of you know being this biological thing that we are Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I, and I don't know what level it occurs at. I mean, yeah. is, it, is it, you know, it, it, like you would assume a single cell organism is not self aware. No, no. But we are. Yeah. At what point in between do, do they become self aware and do they have conscious? Oh, I don't know the answer to that. So, apparent, well, not apparently, but the, I guess the stuff that I've read a lot of um, and listened to, there's a guy, Joshua Bach. He's a, a German um, computer scientist and he's like crazy deep in the AI because essentially like AI, like general intelligence is going to solve that. So if we get to the point of general intelligence, then you you essentially understand what consciousness kind of is because you, you, by definition, you'd have to make something self-aware. But the way he explains it is it's just intelligence that's creating models. And so he uses the example of a thermometer being the most basic like you've got a uh like a a set point which would be the correct temperature and then a a deviation from the set point and then as soon as that you get deviation from that set point then the thermometer moves to match the the temperature right Mm. so that's like a model and that's the most basic like one factor model that um you could implement and so he basically says like we're no different except we have the ability to make these really complex models to the point where we model our own uh, self, which then becomes like this kind of self-awareness. And then it's like you can get it so within that it gets so complicated that you try and model the entire universe and then you model how the uh, modeling, I guess, phenomenon occurs and then that's like trying to figure out what consciousness is. So that's the, I guess, the theory that people are sort of trying to, prove is that um it's basically like consciousness is just the ability to make these super detailed models that extend to what is the universe as opposed to just moving the temperature mm. yeah, yeah so it's a fasc- like a fascinating <laughs> like place to go and but i think it, the crazy part of it is that we don't understand it yet we can figure out how to stop it enough to cut somebody's leg open bash a rod down their femur stitch them all back up and then they wake up and they didn't feel anything they don't have any memory of it it's so crazy to be able to interrupt that process mm. yeah yeah and, and look that's more about um you don't necessarily need to um a lot of the processes and things we use in medicine you have evidence that it works you don't always know exactly why and how that's crazy you know and and you've just got to base your decisions on what you know yeah and then fill in the gaps as best you can and and make a judgment of what's going to be the best treatment for somebody you don't necessarily know 100 percent about what's going Uh, to that point you've just got to put it together and and pick what you think is going to be the best you know so it's um yeah, it's the same sort of process. So you don't necessarily need to know every minutia of how the brain works because we don't. Yeah. To know that if you give drug A, the you know you, you get you're, this result. You get this result. Yeah, yeah. Um, and a lot of that's probably trial and error. You know, that's that's what studies are for. Yeah, yeah. So you can work out what the end result is. Um, the working out how you get there is often much harder. Is the has there been significant improvements in the um, anesthetic process since you've started, or are we using similar stuff to what we've kind of always used? Oh no, there's always new drugs coming out. I mean, the, the details. Are, we need to get an anesthetist on here to have That'd a chat to you as well. Too. Yeah, 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 we yeah. should bring one down. Um, but they're definitely improving. You know, yeah. the, the patients get you know less nausea. They wake up faster. They feel better. They. Yeah. You know, hopefully anesthetics are getting safer. Yeah. You know, as you go along, the, 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 there's always improvements. And, and they're no different to us. There's things come up all the time, you know, like we were talking about pyrocarbon. Well, they'll get a new drug that, yeah. that you know, I'll say, you know, it might – and then most things have trade-offs, you know, they, they might Be work better, better here, but, but not as good there. And, yeah. and, um, and, and, that's, and that's the art of being an anesthetist. You know, they, they've got to work out what the best cocktail for you is yeah. for this procedure. That, that is that would be an interesting podcast actually because that is such an interesting 
uh, thing that we just don't understand. Like even the, when you go to sleep, you kind of wake up feeling like time has passed. Yeah. But when you have a surgery where you go completely unconscious or like they take you away yeah. that you, do, you actually don't even have a concept of time. You're like, no. And that, and that's probably because you don't, you're not asleep. You're yeah, unconscious. Right. So yeah, you don't have, okay. you don't have normal REM sleep or yeah, yeah. Um, even patients that are uh, in ICU for an extended period of time that uh, are receiving sort of anesthetic drugs and they're being mm. ventilated. They're not having normal REM sleep. So they might have been there not doing anything for a month. You and wake them up like a, and they're tired yeah. because they haven't slept. Wow. They've been unconscious, but they haven't had a sleep. I've never thought of that. That would be, yeah, wow. That's crazy to think about that. Uh, and then you get the people that, like I've got, had, have you listened to Remy Morton's podcast? I'm not sure. No. He has the most insane story of he had a really traumatic brain injury um he had a huge huge crash actually can you type that in remy morton crash if you want to see something super gnarly um but he ended up with a a really gnarly like brain injury and he had to he was in a coma he lived an entire two years of life while he was in i think it was a month that he was in this coma for and he woke up from this coma and was so this is this is a crash here that's a very big jump for a mountain bike ah oh, that's there's a there is a better video of it see if see if there's another one uh, yeah draw try and find it um but yeah so he wakes up from this coma and fully remembers a, basically what he said was a two year life that he lived while he was in this coma mm. so I don't know what's going on there but you kind of hear a lot of crazy stories of people that wake up from comas that you know they can. there's some people that have even spoken another language when, when they've woken up from something like that yeah, yeah. so there's some oh here it is here yeah that's a decent hit yeah so he I don't know that he broke anything though I think it was just, just like the, brain injury the, yeah big impact yeah. to the head so yeah, I don't know what's going on in those coma type situations when you yeah you get people that either like wake up speaking a different language or they it's just like what is going on, mate? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> outside your wheelhouse, <laughs> it's so outside my wheelhouse. But uh, no, you do you do see people that you know after prolonged things like that, like after a long operation, you you know they might have been asleep on the table for nine hours. They don't wake up like they've had a nine hour sleep. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. A, I've never thought of that. Yeah, it's a, it's a different. The state's different. You know, yeah. it's not your, your brain's not functioning like when you're asleep. It's yeah. it's different to that. Yeah, right. So when you're in those long days, is it really hard to stay focused for that long? And to and I guess another thing too would be if is there a lot of research and preparation that you would have to do for each surgery like i mean for a podcast like this i'm gonna try and read a little bit about the person i'm gonna if it's a motocross rider i'm gonna go and watch all their highlights and i'm gonna you know kind of try and piece together a bit of a story in my head but if you're doing that many people a day are you having to do like that level of research or is it to the point where you can actually you know what the injury is and once it's open and in front of you then you can go to work from that point forward uh it, it depends what you're doing um a normal routine operation when um like, like i've i've been doing this for 20 odd years mm. so um most of the routine things you've done them so many times what you want is it to go to flow exactly how it normally does, and yeah. that's why you need the right staff around you, yeah. you know, to help you because they know what you like, and it all flows the same way. Is it to the point yeah. where your nurses and like assistants basically like you see in the movies where you put your hand out and they're so dialed in that they know exactly what you want? Yeah, most of my staff are. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's got to be a cool feeling. Yeah, they, they they can look and see, you know, what they know where you're up to. I'm yeah. sure if if. You weren't there they could probably complete most of it without you there really yeah but um the the yes they're, they're dialed in like that and for normal routine operation that's what you want if you're doing something what would be an example out of, the box, of a normal routine surgery for you guys oh um most of our elective surgery you know so and that might range from something as simple as a carpal tunnel release or yep. um 
you know, through to doing a joint replacement or something like that. You just want every step to be the same each time. Yeah. That's where the, the least problems occur. Yeah. Um, if you're doing something a bit unusual, like, you know, something a bit um, uncommon or... Like a trauma-based thing, maybe? Sometimes a trauma, sometimes an operation that where you've got to be a bit creative with it because patient's missing a lot of bone or something like that. That's one you might do a fair bit of prep for. And that, the prep might be anything from um, just going through it the night before about what you're going to do. It might be designing a prosthesis like some of them might need a custom prosthesis oh really um like even even now when we're doing say a shoulder replacement um we use navigation for a lot of that now the nav equipment is pretty much like the optical system on a on a computer game so there's two cameras that are looking and then all your instruments have got trackers on them so it can tell where you are in space with them really and so for a patient like that so say you were having a shoulder replacement next week We'd do a CT scan, we'd upload it. Um, sometime between now and that the, the night before, I'd have a look at it. We'd, we'd pull it up on software that's you know really cool software that you can spin around. You can trial all the different shapes and sizes of the prosthesis, work out which one's going to fit you the best. Wow. If it's a non, if we might find that the non, the custom ones don't fit and we've got to order you a smaller size or something like that, you can identify that ahead of time, talk to the rep. When, when you're in theatre, and you've exposed the shoulder, you bolt one of the trackers to the bone and then you map it. So there's a, 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 a tool for mapping it and it'll say, touch this point, you touch it, scribble over this point, you scribble over that, and it builds uh, um, a, a knowledge of where the your like shoulder... Like a 3D space, kind of. Yeah, so it uses your CT scan that we've uploaded to it and then where we've touched in the model, to, it will then work out where that is in space compared to the tracker and then when you then go to say drill a hole, it will um, show you where the drill's going to enter and where it's going to exit. And you can say, "Well, I'm not happy with that." And you can move it; and it'll show you real time on the screen where you where your drill's going to go. And then we'll drill the space. So that obviously takes a bit of prep. You've got to get the CT. You've got to upload it. You've got to play with it some stage before the surgery to be prepared. So, um, and that's something you, you usually just do it the night before. You'll sit on there and prep it. And then when you get there, it's on a memory stick. You load it up, and then you've got it all there to help you when you when you're operating. That's insanely cool. Yeah. Oh, it's good fun. It is. <laughs> it is actually good fun. And that's yeah. and, and essentially one of, that goes back to that. Um, you said, well, why would you pick to be an upper limb surgeon or an orthopedic surgeon or? A, and it's what you find. Fun's probably not quite the word, but enjoyable. Like yeah, you know, yeah. that sort of surgery to me is enjoyable. Yeah, that's why you head down that pathway. You know, you come home thinking, oh, "I did something cool today." You know, I really enjoyed that. The patient did well; they're going to get a great result. You want to be getting operated on by the doctor that really thinks operating is fun. Yeah, absolutely. I think. I, think. I, I yeah. don't think fun is the wrong word because I think whenever you're having fun at your job, you're going to do. You're going to do a better job. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And you're going to get through the end of the day and think, oh, well, that was great. How do you keep focus for that long? Because if you're doing 14 hours of surgery a day, you'd think that that would be extremely taxing on the mind. Uh, you do have breaks as you go along. Like you, you know, when you're turning a patient over, you you, um, you, you get, a, a, I guess, a little bit of recovery time there. It's actually not that hard to focus when you're doing the surgery. It's actually harder to focus when you're not doing the surgery. Yeah, like right. It's harder to assist for 14 hours than it is to operate for 14 hours. Yeah, okay. Um, because you're not doing it. When you're doing it, it makes you focus. I guess it's like if you're riding a bike, yeah. you're looking in front, yeah. you know, where your front wheel's going. Yeah. You're not you're not swinging your head around looking at all sorts of other things. It's, very, it's easy to stay focused when you're on the bike. Yeah. When you're off the bike... Not so easy. Yeah, you know, I so. guess it'd be uh, analogous to being a passenger in a car on a road trip. Yeah, it's always seems that's when you're to, not off. Yeah, le- yeah, yeah. It's always harder to stay awake when you're not the one that that's driving. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and and that's I guess what theatre's like. It's it's easier to stay focused when you're doing it. And the, the, the classic example of that is if you're doing a really long case under the microscope. You know, so you're sewing a finger back on or an arm <laughs> back on or something like that. It it, it that's when it's hard to assist because it's a long operation and you're not doing it. You're just helping. Yeah. And um, 
you know, we've all had episodes where you, you, the microscope's down between you and you're looking in and you know when you're, your assistant's nodding off because he leans on the microscope and it jams both eyepieces into your eyeballs. Yeah, <laughs> so right. <laughs> you give a little kick under the table. <laughs> Oi, get, get, wake up. Yeah, yeah, because it is harder to focus when you're the passenger. Yeah, yeah. You're helping, but you're not you're not having to it's not that same interaction. Yeah. Does that make sense? No, oh, no, yeah. totally. Do yeah. you do you get into uh what you'd call, I guess, a flow state when you're doing surgery? What do you mean by that? Have you like heard of flow state before? No. Like uh, where you're so immersed in the task that time seems to dilate, and uh, it would be the same thing that what you'd hear about an athlete that's in the zone, where yeah. they they don't hear the crowd, they don't, you know, they lose concept that they're in a stadium filled with people, and all they see is like a baseball coming at them, and then it's so slow, and then they they whack it, and then it's a home run, and then as soon as they've hit the ball and realise they've hit a home run, the crowd rushes back to them, and then you know. So in your case, it would be like you'd be more aware of the entire theatre, not just like the part of the body that you're working on. There, there probably are moments where you sort of approach that, yeah, and you're you're doing something really fiddly, or you know, and. You, you've got to be really focused and um and then yes when you finish that and you're back into the flow of things it, it's you're, you're interacting with people that's probably why um you know sometimes you'll be in, engaged in the conversation in theater but when it gets to that moment you, you sort of disengage from the conversation theater do what you got to do and then re-engage yeah. i suppose so there are there are moments a bit like that yeah, yeah. probably yeah. not to the same level but yeah it's yeah, and I'm sure it's in those super challenging moments where it just takes like so much focus yeah. to get it right. Yeah, or something not going exactly how you'd planned or, mm. you know, you need something different. You'd plan for A, but you've got to do B. They're the sort of moments where, you, you know, you, you lose track of time a bit and, yep. and those sorts of things, yeah. Because they, they talk about, um, there's some interesting like books and stuff on, on that whole concept of flow and I guess like the way that uh, like the neural, uh, like, neurologically what's going on like different centers of the brain are shutting off to give more like more resources to whether it's like the prefrontal cortex or whatever um but they also talk about group flow where um basically you know you'll see basketball teams or like any kind of team sport where they're so interactive it's almost like they don't even need to talk to each other um to you know pull off a play that they're working you know that they've practiced or whatever um i could imagine it's a a sort of a similar thing in theater as well where just everyone is just so uh, dialed in on like what they're doing that the, the whole group is almost acting as like one unit in a sense yeah i think that's why it's it's when you haven't got your regular team. Mm. It's um, it, it, you, you've got to actually watch what everyone else is doing. Whereas when you've got your normal team, you you can almost you, you trust everybody to do the team thing, mm. and you know it's going to be done. And and it's certainly um, it, it's way more stressful to spend a day in a. You might have a theatre of really good staff, but that don't normally work with you. Yeah that's way more stressful than having your regular team because um, you've kind of got to think about their jobs as well and check yeah. that they're all being done and not just focus on your part, you know. Yeah. And, and and so that's why, we, you know, people say, oh, I go to Darwin once a month and do a clinic up there. Oh, yeah. And I've done that for a long time. It's about 10 years I've done that. And they, they often say, oh, can you start operating up here? And I, I'm always very reluctant to do it because, um, and I've never done it, because you don't have any of your team there. Yeah. You know, and, and you'd have to start rebuilding another one and because you're only there once a month, you'd probably never get there. Yeah, yeah. And so every every time you did anything up there would be um, more stressful, more more chance of something going wrong because you haven't got your your, your people around that you trust. What what are some examples of things that can go wrong in your the surgeries that you do commonly? Oh, almost anything. Really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, there's always things that can go wrong in an operation. I mean, that that can range from um, something general like a, a problem with the anaesthetic through to a problem with the surgery. And um, one of the things we worry about with with bone and joint and muscle, you know, type operations is infection. You know, things can always yeah. get infected, um, and so you're very mindful of of um, sterility and you know all those sorts of things. You you do everything you can to minimise it. You know, you you make sure people have you know pre op washes and they you prep and drape properly and they get appropriate antibiotics and they get post-op antibiotics. And, and so we do everything on every patient we do to stop it. 
things can still go wrong. Yeah. So, and doing an operation on bones, it's not uncommon for you to get in there and the, you thought it was one piece of bone, but as you, you know, it's it's got sort of fracture lines all through and as you touch it, that one piece becomes 10 pieces. Oh. And suddenly you're looking at it going, okay, well, this is different to what yeah. we planned. So, and that can happen a lot with fractures. You, they're, they're often more complicated than you think when you go in. So, you know, things like motocross riders and, yeah. you know, you go in going, oh, it looks like it's in six pieces, but when you get in there, it's in 26 pieces. Oh, God, I yeah, can't even imagine. So how did you get into the motocross stuff? You, I mean, you do a lot of sport uh, in general, but, I mean, the list of guys that you've worked with in the motocross industry is extensive. It's, it's been a fair few. It's been a lot. Yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's a good business to be in, in a way. <laughs> but Look, but it, uh, there's... Yeah, like how I guess how did you get into that? It was it just like one guy come in first and word of mouth spread and over the X period of time you're kind of the go to guy. To to a degree. Um the the first um motocross rider I treated was Troy Carroll. Yeah, right. Yeah, who who we're still actually really good friends yeah, today and great dude. Yeah, lovely bloke. We 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 went to the radio two weekends ago together oh, and yeah. you know when it was on and we just, you know, he's he's got a great family yeah. and we hang out with him and um, so he's become a, a true friend, really, over time. So, um, but Troy was the first one, and and I'm actually not sure even how he ended up in our practice. I think you know someone must have referred yeah. him word of mouth again, and and said, look, come and see. And, and he was probably probably just after the peak of his career in in motocross. And um, so, what are we talking like? Oh six, oh seven, maybe something like that. Yeah, it would have been riding for like Cool S Suzuki, I think, at the time, was it? Might have been, yeah. yeah, okay, yeah. Your memory's better than mine. Yeah, I know, for motocross, for motocross, not, I wouldn't be for sure. Yeah, it was around that time though, yeah. and 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 Troy had, had a shoulder injury, and we looked after him. And as it was going along, he, he said to me, "Look, you, you should you should actually come to the track and and be part of Race Safe." Yeah, okay. Um, and, and I thought, oh, yeah, and I, and I think he'd sort of weighed up that. He, I was probably somebody who could talk to the riders a bit too, and yeah. and we did a good job on his shoulder, and his shoulder did well, and and so as it came along, he'd obviously mentioned it to Simon Mars, who, mm-hmm. who runs Race Safe. Shout out to Simon, really Shout, good dude. He's a great bloke, yeah. yeah, and he does a brilliant job, really yeah, good job. Yeah. He's honestly saved lives at this point. Oh, from absolutely, a hundred percent saved yeah. lives at motocross tracks. Yeah, a- a- absolutely. You know, and and actually, I've been there when when they've had lives saved at, yeah, at the track. Right. You know, working with them and things. So, um, like one year at, um, uh, and once again, I, I was trying to Kirk about this, but one year at, at Coolum, you know, they got to Kirk and he was, um, oh, Gibbsy was 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 that um, not breathing. Had, was that the one at Coolum? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Coolum. Yeah, right. Yeah, so he was not breathing when they got to him and. You know, the guys do a great job. Uh, what, they what resussed was that, him. What and, was that injury then? Oh, he went... Y- y- you remember the old cooling track where you went down and you turned right, right. and then there was that, that big, big jump? Yep, yep, yep. I, th- I think one of the other la- riders landed on him. Do you remember that, Griff? What year was that? Oh, big, more than 10 years ago, I think. Yeah, oh, okay. Maybe 10. Yeah, what yeah, what colour bike was he on then, you remember? And I don't remember that. <laughs> you just remembered how to fix it. I remember it. the injury. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So um, what yeah, what was it? And, and look he, he wasn't breathing when they got to him and oh, so okay. you know, he was resuscitated and he had a you know but he's race hope saved him, basically. Mm. So they, they do a fantastic job. They really do. Yeah, I don't um, think they get the credit they deserve actually in in the in Australia. Because I guess I guess it's the medical profession in general. When you do a great job and save somebody's life, that's kind of the expected outcome. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, it, well, it is a little bit. Yeah. 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 The expectation is you'll get through. I yeah. Suppose, it's like, but, oh, thank you. You saved his life. That's yeah. what you're here for. But it's yeah. like, it's a really big deal. Yeah. I think most of the riders appreciate it. Yeah. I, I do think they, um, I think they notice if they're not there. Yeah. Too. Like, as you know, when they go to, lower level you know competitions and there isn't that support there i think they do notice i mean they certainly say to us that they do yeah yeah um but yeah obviously i think troy had always had a word to simon and then i spoke to simon and i said oh well yeah i'll come along and have a look one day and we did and and it just sort of grew from there between word of mouth from troy to other people and and on and me working at you know race safe occasionally and um, that's it's a, probably a bigger group than you than you imagine that race safe. There's, yeah. there's a couple of core people like Simon, um, but then everyone else really is volunteers. And and at any race day, they'll usually have 
Um, they'll have a couple of the local paramedics. There'll be at least a couple of, of paramedics that have come with Race Safe. There's usually about four of them, I think. They try to have three or four doctors on, on for the day and preferably in different specialties. You know, they'll try and have someone orthopedic trained. Yeah an anaesthetist or an emergency physician or you know someone like that to manage airways and yep. that sort of thing um and so there's usually a real smattering of people uh, there's often even a psychologist says there, a couple of physios that'll do all the strapping and the yep. it's a big crew of people that go and they take the truck that's got um they've got a couple of trucks but one's got one resus bay and the big one's got two resus bays in it so you can have a couple going at one time um so there's a big crew of people and and last time i looked there was more than 50 people on the on their roster. On their roster. And, and essentially they say, look, what races would you like to come and do this year? And you say, oh, look, I'd love to do Coolum and Phillip Island. And, you know, and they, you just work it out. And, and they pay for you to get there um, if you've got to fly or something. But essentially it's all volunteer work. And, and but every week they front up with a massive crew of people there just to help. Yeah. Which no, is super cool. Yeah, yeah. And they, and they work with um, they work with the tracks and things as well. Like we... When you go for the sort of the pre-race briefing, you know, Simon's got all the stats there. He'll say to you, look, from the past few years, um, this is the two turns where all the accidents happen. We're going to park one, you know, uh, rhino at this one. We're going to park one at this one. Um, We're going to, you know, it's all very planned. And at the end of the season, they might have um, stats to say, look, this is, there's a lot of accidents occurring here you know and one of those examples i think was coolum you know yeah that, where, with that jump yeah and so which isn't really there anymore i don't no, think is it they've no. taken it out yeah it goes the other way now yeah and so simon will actually go and talk to the the guys at the track and say this this corner is a bit dangerous what are we going to do about it you That's know so, so cool so hopefully the tracks are improving and it's it's just all part of that service that they offer so they do you know, he said, shout out to Simon. He does a fantastic job and it's great to be part of. I haven't done many for a few years because yeah. between COVID and my kids are sort of at that teenage stage, it's, it's a bit hard to do the time. But I, I, I want to go back and start doing a few more events. And oh, that's awesome. Which mate. should be good. Yeah. 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 Um, so you do your first motocross event. Had you had much exposure to motocross before? Very you? little. Really? And what yeah. did you think when you got there? Oh, it was awesome. Yeah, yeah loved it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, I can remember one of the guys, the first wet one I did, I remember them telling me to stand behind the start line and uh, you, work, you work out that's a problem pretty yeah, quickly. Yeah, yeah. Um, but no, it was great. No, I really enjoyed it. And, and look, I think that's um, – I think a lot of the riders feel comfortable coming and seeing me, but it's the reverse too. Like, I, you know, they've always um, – I think they appreciate race safe and when they saw you, someone who's giving you time for nothing there to help, Yeah, I think they um, – you know the, the reverse is true too. They they make you feel like you're sort of part of the family, yep. you know, and such. And and so it's it's a it's a it's a good relationship. I think that's why it works, and yep. why they like coming. You know, they know that I, you know, I, I've developed an interest in it over time because yeah. I know most of the guys. Yeah. And I tend to watch all the races now on the weekends, and um, but they know that you're interested and you're there helping, and they you know, so everyone makes you feel welcome. Yeah. So, yeah, and I think that it comes back to sort of what we said at the start, you know, like I think everyone's had that um, that horror story of being either sent away when something was broken and needed surgery. Like I've got my collarbone here is just completely jacked from just being turned away at a hospital. Like, ah, it's fine. It's now it's like, well, we probably could have had something done to it, you know? Yeah. So I think that when you are, uh, even if it's just a casual motocross athlete, you are still an athlete that needs to be able to use both arms and both legs to ride the bike and you know there is sometimes unfortunately an attitude especially in the emergency room and you can understand why because there's just emergency on emergency coming through and it's basically like save the person's life get them out out the (laughs) door kind of thing um but there is a real need for you know someone like yourself that just really wants the best possible outcome and I'm sure there's times where you kind of have to go outside the box or, you know, like do different things to try and really make sure that a good result, you know, is the outcome. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. and I I think that's the way we treat them. You know, Mm. it it doesn't seem any different to me to being any other athlete. And and, um, and I think when they come and if we look after them, they, they get treated well, you know, the... The staff happy to see them. They, you know, they walk in, they get treated nicely. We talk about their sport and when they want to be ready for the next race, and mm. you know, it's uh, and then you, you try and get them ready. That's it's like any any 
patient really it's not any different so we we try to treat everyone the same and look after them so is there would you say a common what like some of the most common motocross injuries oh can yeah, you see a can you there, see a trend there, look there's a few the, yeah. the clavicle fractures one yeah. you know and that's just part of the sport you know you land heavily on your shoulder there's a fair chance you're going to break your clavicle we do probably plate a lot more of the motocross riders clavicles than you do because in the general they can public go back to it go back i mean yeah. if you get a standard mid shaft clavicle fracture the average time to union is about 10 to 12 weeks yeah that's just about you've lost most of the season, season yeah you know so we do um and we don't just say oh that needs plating but you'll actually talk to the rider and say look where are you in the season you know when do you want to be back these are the likely time frames and you can talk it through with them and and more often than not, they'll say, yeah, look, I think I'll, I'll get it fixed and I'll try and get back, you know, in a few rounds or next round or whatever it might be, depending on timing. Yeah. Um, so we played a lot of clavicles. That's, that's, Did you do um, Todd's in like 08? When, when he, he cartwheeled was, up, up at uh, was, the Toowoomba? Was, was it Toowoomba? Yeah. yeah. And he was leading the championship. Yeah. And then he cartwheeled. It was his first year debut on a 450. And then did you play that one and then he raced the next weekend? Yep. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, and he sent me a message the next weekend saying, oh, I fell off three times, but my shoulder feels fine. Really? <laughs> yeah. So what is it about a collarbone where... Because there's not every injury that you can do that. Like, what no. is it about a collarbone? Oh, look, it, it depends what you're playing. It depends on the fracture. And um, you've got to be confident you've got enough fixation that they're going to be reasonably safe. Um, you know, and I, I, I will say to... Like, I, I can remember having a conversation with Todd at that stage about... You know how important is it to ride next weekend because yeah. you know in an ideal world we'd leave us sort of 12 weeks get solid and heal but he was i think winning the championship at that stage he said no it's pretty important for my career so you, you you've got to kind of we, we we did our best to get him ready you know yeah. and, and it as it turned out it worked really well we we put two plates on instead of one and made it as solid as we can and and got him back so and uh it survived that is yeah. crazy. It's crazy to think that you can literally bolt and plate something together like a Meccano set and you can make it strong enough for someone to go and race motocross in a week. Yeah, you, you, you can sometimes. It depends yeah. on the injury. Yeah, yeah. And the, but, yeah, yeah, that's what we're, we're aiming for for him, you know, so that's what, we're, that's what he wanted. That's what we we're trying to achieve for him. So um, it, it does depend a bit. There's it, lots of good kit. You know, and, and that's one of the things that has changed over um, time is that there's a lot of anatomic specific plates now, you know, that allow, allow you to get a better hold on the bone. Yeah. Um, if you go back 30 years, there weren't many. Like most of the kits came with just a straight plate that you could bend yourself. Really? Yeah. And so you could never really get it quite like you can get it now. So, so what's a, what would we type in to see like a modern like collarbone plate? Can, oh, is there pictures of them online? Oh, there will be. Um, the um, you just if you just type in um, clavicle plate, see what comes up, and then or we can type in some specific brands or. Yep. That's it. P L A T E. Because yep. I I actually don't have any hardware in me at all. There you go. There's there's some plates, and they're all they've all got twists and bends and shapes to be go on various parts of the bone. Oh, whether yeah. you've got a lateral fracture or a mid fracture or one medial or there's um. And if you look at, say, this picture here with the shoulder, that's more the old style. Like, he'll have a, a, a plate that was just a straight plate that you bent yourself. Okay. That'll be one. And, and they're quite proud. And, and they're, whereas most of those other plates are ones that are pre-contoured and designed to fit and be relatively low profile. Um, sometimes they're, they're designed so that you can get two plates on, like that one up in the top, top Go, corner that there. Top, that top left one there. Yeah, okay. And so it, there's just a lot more of that sort of equipment now that you can design and yeah. and um, <coughs> have available. Sometimes if you're plating something like that for a motocross, we might even have two or three brands there. Yeah. And you might draw the ones out of your favourite tray and go, actually, none of those fit properly. Let's go to the next tray. Yeah. And you'll you'll try it out until you get something that fits well and then plate up because clavicles are, are a bone that, like if you take a lot of femurs out or something, they're all pretty much the same shape. Yeah. Clavicles are all a bit different. It's ah, a very right, variable right. sort of bone. Yeah, okay. And so you sometimes have to play around a little bit and get, get the right fit. Have you ever worked with companies to develop specific products for surgery? It's funny you should ask that. Um, 
the the we've actually engaged with a couple of companies at the moment to do some research for them. Yeah. Um, and and one to probably do a bit of design work for plates and things like for clavicles and things. So um, it's something we want to get into a bit more. Like a, I guess when you, you you're starting work in in the field that I'm in, you, you you spend the first few years just making sure you you're really nailing the 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 surgery part of it. Yeah. And and that you're doing that really well, and then you you spend probably the next part of the time trying to nail the processes behind it like getting your yep. practice to run really well and yeah, really efficiently yeah, yeah. and then when you've got that under your belt then the next thing for me anyway is I want to actually start doing more design work and work with some yep. companies and try and create some better products that we can use so it's something we're actually trying to get into at the moment we've just started a couple of research projects which is great yeah really interesting stuff and um, um, and so what does that look like the research project component oh, of it? Look, the research, the, the main project we've got running at the moment is one looking at use of uh, autologous tina sites in people with tennis elbow. So it's a relatively mundane sort of um, complaint, but it's a really common problem. Yeah, yeah. And um, there's a there's a uh, company in Perth called OrthoCell that, that will grow biological tissue for you. And one of the things they'll do is grow tina sites. So if you had tennis elbow we can take well, I it i actually do get tennis elbow a bit from jiu jitsu yeah. yeah right well yeah. well what we do if it gets bad enough and and it looks amenable on the on your scans is take a tiny piece of um uh your own tendon usually out of your wrist we usually use a tendon called palmaris longus which is yeah. it's, an, it's, yeah. a, it's an interesting tendon if you pinch your thumb to your little finger and flex your wrist forward it usually sticks out. Yeah. Now, not everyone's got one. 13% of wrists don't have a palmaris longus. Really? Some people have it one side, not the other. Wow. It's, thought, it's thought to be something that's um, disappearing from the human race because we don't need it anymore. What would it um, would it have been used for? Just climbing, maybe? Climbing, yeah, probably. Yeah, tree yeah. swinging. Yeah. Uh. So it's a great donor tendon because it doesn't do anything in humans anymore. Yeah, so we often right. take a little slither of palmaris if you've got one. Um, they only need a millimetre of tendon. Um, we send it off to the lab in Perth. They extract your tendon cells out of it, check that it's a healthy cell wow. that's producing type 1 collagen, and then they grow it. And, and when they've got 10 to 15 million cells of yours, they send them back in a jar and we inject them into the tendon and try and help your tendon to heal. regenerate. Yeah. So what, what is tennis elbow? Like is it... Uh it's it's a it's a degenerative tendinopathy of the tendon. So, uh, unfortunately, they call it a tendonitis, but it's not really an itis. It's not an inflamed tendon. It's a degenerating tendon, and so um, it, it probably fits in somewhere in in the spectrum of what they call apoptosis. So, programmed cell death. So, y your cell line will only replicate so many, so many times, times, and then yeah. it, and then it goes, I'm out, and that's probably been a, a developmental um, thing to make sure they don't continue to replicate until there's a genetic error and you, and you have get a, cancer cells get cancer. essentially yeah. yeah okay so it's probably been a protective mechanism but it means that at some point the, the, your cells die yeah and in people that have got a degenerate tendon like that um, if they take a specimen of it they, they usually see well up to about 30 or 40 percent of the cells in the tendon dying okay and they're going through this apoptosis process and so instead of you having a really healthy tendon with tightly packed type 1 collagen you end up with this really loose arrangement with all this gelatinous sort of goo in it yep. and often the tendon has failed in the middle and you end up with a bit of a hole and so the tendon's just degenerating and not not repairing itself well enough yeah right and so the idea comes from if you can show that the tendon that's not repairing has less cells in it that are alive then does the replacing reverse, the yeah, cells yeah allow it to heal yeah and it would appear that it does you know there's some decent literature to show that uh, tendons healing when you replace the tendon cells yeah and so you're now involved in a research study of like physically doing those procedures and then recording the results essentially yeah, essentially yeah yeah that's it in a nutshell we want to see if they get better faster if you put the cells back in and have you so. and is that what you have been finding uh it would certainly appear that way yeah we, we've um We've done about 170 of these so far in, in people and they seem to be getting better faster. We've sort of crunched a lot of data and that will come. Yeah. And we're looking at some very specific subsets of these people in this in the research project we're doing. Um, but that's what we want to know is, is it, you know, we've, they've shown it works in the lab. They've shown that you get improved tendon. Does that equate to good outcomes? Yeah, you know, right. So, 
So that's that's the project we're working on mostly at the moment. We've got a couple of other things starting up, but we also want to start doing some design work and things. So and yeah, partner okay. with some people. So that's so cool. Yeah, I um I've been just with jujitsu. Like I recently, I had um my coach. I was I had like a his arm was out like this, and then I kind of wrapped my arm over and around, and then I grabbed the far side of his like collar here mm. so like this his arm was trapped through there essentially yep. and he's a real big dude and he's just like yanked it out um and then i got it felt like a bone bruise kind of in my wrist for a while and yeah. it was like, i had to stop training for like a couple of weeks um but then when i went back to training i just felt like i it's uh i don't really feel it like in my elbow but it feels like the pain comes from my elbow and it sort of ended up in like the middle of my arm kind of yeah so i don't know whether it is like a tendonitis or it, it might be people often feel it through this part of their arm yeah that yeah. that's sort of where it was like coming down in there yeah yeah, okay. Probably and that, is a bit. And, and that's from like a degeneration of the... <laughs> well, it's often an event to trigger stuff. the symptoms, yeah. yeah okay. in, that, in that if you had a perfectly normal tendon, probably would have recovered very quickly. Whereas yeah, if yeah. you've got a degenerate tendon and you get a bit of an injury to it and then yeah, okay. they just don't repair themselves well, you know. So, um, yeah, that's, that's where that project's headed essentially. So hopefully in a couple of years we can... We'll, we'll have some good data to show if it's uh, yeah. if it's if it's uh, um, well. What we're trying to com really show is if you, you the specific study we're working on is that we're trying to show if you treat them earlier, do they get better faster? Yeah, okay. And 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 we've certainly we've done about 170 or of these delayed as procedures for people who have failed to improve yeah. over a six to six month plus period. Um, and this is really to just look at see if people get better quicker if you if you don't wait the time you actually treat them up front and, and then do you think that this kind of uh, treatment then it sort of starts in the tennis elbow kind of you know that tendon area but do you think that this is something that could be applicable to all tendons or is it specific just to that one no there's the, the trials going on in multiple tendons they're trying it in rotator cuff tendons glute, gluteal tendons achilles tendons so it's, it's it will have applications elsewhere yeah. Did, how's the i guess the technology how has it changed since you've obviously a lot but can you see you know the is it like an exponential curve is it like a linear curve of of the way the technology is changing uh, the way that the body can recover is it ramping up quicker than ever before do you think or is it still a similar process uh no i think i think i think it's probably pretty linear in that it takes it takes a lot of processes you know steps is that, in that process. Litigate, litigation more than technology I just think it's in. Um, it's not necessarily based on ideas. It's based on how quickly you can get an idea to yeah. to that point. And 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 um, uh, I, I I don't know that you've necessarily seen an explosion of change. Because um, you'd kind of assume that would be as technology gets better, you'd assume that you know the way that we see tech change and the kind of leaps and bounds that the tech world yeah. has like it's not the case in the medical world in a sense not not so much because it takes a lot you can't just develop an idea and run with it you've yeah. got a, a whole process of actually getting it there so i think it slows it down a lot but but yeah, it's an interesting process so uh, and something we want to get more involved in so so what were we talking about the i guess just how like technology yeah. how, like how you see it kind of changing i mean it, it because it's one of those things where you just see like technology has kind of changed everything and it sort of comes in like this massive sort of wave, you know, like you almost blink and, and everything's different. Do you see any of that sort of stuff kind of coming in the future? Absolutely. Like and, 3D and, printing and, you know. Yeah, look, we already 3D print parts and, and, and order custom prostheses. I mean, if there's somebody that's got a very specific defect, you can... Um, you can sit with the engineers and actually design a piece to fit what they're missing, um, and uh, um, yeah, you know, with it's a work in progress. You know, yeah. that that will improve a lot over time, but that that ability is still there. A lot of the original work with that actually was done at Queensland Uni, really, with um, you know, printing of um, uh, pieces for skulls and and to put in, and, and a lot of it came from that. So. Um, so yeah, we do 3D print. We do, um, you know, there's not a lot of places for robotics yet in in upper limb, 
but there is in lower limb. Like a, a lot of that stuff starts in lower limb surgery because there's more of it. Yeah. You okay. know, say, um, for example, knee replacements and hip replacements, you know, there's thousands and thousands done every year in Australia. Well, there's about 150 elbow replacements or that sort of oh, really? done in Australia a year. So huh. the numbers are quite different. And so the tech often flows from, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. This company obviously wants return on their investment. Yeah. So the prosthetic companies obviously put a lot of money into developing it for, say, a knee. And then that'll flow through and, and, and we'll develop it. Like we're already using a lot of, um, we are talking about it before, using the, um, the navigation to yep. help. And the navigation is really helpful. Um, robotics is still finding its place and what it's good for and what it's not good for. And, and there's not much scope in upper limb yet, but that's coming. That would be one of the next things we, we may have to adopt and or not have to, but, you know. Like arthroscope. Uh, more, more for things like joint replacement. You know where, okay. um, you know I said to you before, you might have sat the night before and 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 planned an operation. This is where I want to put the prosthesis. Well, where the robot comes in is when you actually get to that process. Um, to get to that point in the operation, you can ask the robot to do the cut for you, so it's accurate. You know, yeah. it's right on exactly what you planned, and and then you have to evaluate. Well you know, did we actually get benefit out of using that robot? Like, did it actually help the end outcome? And, and that's, and that's what happened has happened with the knee surgeons. When you talk to them, robots are available and they've worked out that these are the cases it helps for, and these are the cases it doesn't help for. And so there's always new technology coming through and you've got to work out what's going to work. Um, there's a lot of, uh, investment in biological type implants at the yeah, moment. Yeah, because you like, think that would be kind of massive, right? Oh, look, if that, if, if that's generally where we're headed you know if, yeah. you, if you can get a biological implant to do something to actually get it to repair itself yeah that's that's obviously the ideal way to treat things we're a long way off being at that level but you know we can grow tenocytes we can grow cartilage cells chond yeah. chondrocytes you know um y you can you can implant them we can um they're making a lot of collagen patches now to augment things and, and they're almost like a collagen sponge to suck up, uh, you know, blood products and things, and, and apply to the outside of tendons to try and encourage them to heal better. Yeah, and, right. Um, they're working on fibroblast growth factors, and all of that sort of stuff will come in over the next ten or fifteen years. And I'll probably see a lot of that in my working lifetime, hopefully. So, uh, and yeah, like so, if you have to get a little bit sci-fi for a minute, hmm. what? Where do you realistically? see it going and i mean it can be a reach and it can be a stretch like a, a sci-fi but where do you kind of like realistically like i could actually see this being a thing one day oh look in my lifetime i can see it being a thing of you know if you needed a tendon repair like you say your rotator cuff yeah that we would um, which i have actually one of those injuries there you go so I, I, the time will come where we harvest some of your own tendon we grow your cells and then that's impregnated into a piece of you know collagen sponge or um, similar that that has probably fibroblast growth factors and those sorts of things impregnated in it as well and and as part of the repair you might sew the tendon back together and then apply this to actually accelerate the healing and make it bit bigger better stronger when it's finished and that that technology is not that far away that's something that we'll see in our lifetimes um, the, the stage beyond that is when you're actually growing body parts and things. I mean, that, that will come one day. Do you think that day. will happen? Oh, eventually, yeah. Whether they can grow a knee or something, I don't know, but they can probably grow organs yeah. and things. So that's that's going to come. And how do you think that process will happen? Um, one of the things that we've seen with the orthopedic things like tenocytes and things and, and chondrocytes especially has been an issue that... Um, they can already grow. So the, chondrocytes the, is cartilage. The cartilage, yeah. yeah. So, so they can already grow the tissue. You know, the, the technology is there. You can send it. They can grow it in a lab and give you cartilage back. The and that would seem to be the hard bit, but that's the bit they've conquered. The yeah. the the bit that's more difficult is how do you use that tissue. Mm. So it, it's a bit akin to you know if you take your um, tire in for a retread. And the guy gives you the rubber. Yeah, in, like in your I've hand. got the rubber. Yeah, yeah and you go, yeah. well, well, that doesn't help. Yeah. Oh, how do I get that to stick to the outside of my tire and function? Well, fortunately, they know how to do that, but we don't. Like, we don't know how to reattach the cartilage well enough to make it work. And yeah. there's lots of people have tried lots of different ways. You know, whether it be um, cells under a membrane or whether it be 
um, plugs of cartilage put in, almost you know, like you're doing a, oh, like a hair, hair transplant. transplant. Yeah, 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 people have tried that, and um, none of them have been great so far. So that's they're, they're the bits that have got to be ironed out, and that takes a lot of trial and error and, yeah. and, and practice, and people have got to do studies, and then to find out if it works or not then takes an enormous amount of time. It's not like they show you the tire and you can see the rubbers attached. It might take years before you know that what you've done has actually helped mm. that patient. And so to evaluate it and come up and say, yeah, we've worked out that method A works better than method B, C, and D. Might take 15 years. Might take decades. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. It can be a really slow process, but the tech's there. It's and they're all they're all working on. It. The companies all want to produce the next big thing. Yeah, well, I mean, that's I guess the the beauty of the kind of system that we live in is that you know you get these companies they make big money off off these life changing products. So it's there's a lot of investment that would go into that sector. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's exciting. Like it's great to go and see what they've got, and um, you know when you go to conferences and things and wander around you look at the talks you look at the new products and and then you decide what you want to adopt and what you might want to try out and you know it, it's it keeps us interested you know yeah. and and what do you think about uh not in your wheelhouse but i guess just the stem cells in in general and that kind of technology like do you think that that's also a real key to us like oh, living longer he- healthier lives probably yeah yeah i, I um Look, what we're doing with the tenocytes is not dissimilar to what they're doing with yeah, stem, stem cells. cells. They're just a more differentiated cell when, than you get when you get to that point. I mean, the stem cells are what they call a pluripotential cell. It can grow up to be anything. Yeah, okay. And so it's it's the magic bullet. You know, you put it in. If it needs to be cartilage, it'll be cartilage. If it needs to be brain, it'll be brain. Yeah. You know, so that's the idea with stem cells. It'll it's it's the magic bullet that will help repair whatever needs repairing, um, and, and and it will come. There's a, there's a whole lot of um, legal issues with with stem cells as well. Like where do you get them from? Where do you yeah. you know? So it, it will it will. There's a lot of phases for that to go through yet to actually get to that point. But yeah, I can see it being a thing. In fact, I, I think ethically, when they it comes time to stem cells, where I can see it going is that um, you know our children's children would potentially save their own stem cells. Like when you when you um, the best source of stem cells I can gather is out of the cord blood. When you've, yeah, you've, yeah. you when you're a baby, you're delivered, you get the placenta. The cord blood's got a significant number of stem cells in it. You know, there's, there's no reason they couldn't separate that into multiple portions and freeze it. Could you do? You, is that something that you could ask? Like, let's say you had a kid, and could you ask now and go, hey? For my kid, I want to get these blood extracted. Like, are people actually doing not, that now? Not that I'm aware of. But yeah, that could be done but though. It's, like, it's not. It's going to come, I think. Yeah, and you can keep, you know. And so when they get to thirty and they've got tennis elbow, they could say, "Could you please unfreeze my vial number one, please? It's time to use it yeah, and have right. a repair job done." You well, know. So what is the? I guess I know a little bit about the ethical concerns behind how you harvest stem cells, but I guess in a nutshell, like, what are the ethical concerns there? Oh, it's around. I guess like when is a human life, or like you know, if you're taking think, it at embryo stage or whatever. Yeah, I think there's just, I think that's a minefield. And and at the moment, most com- countries have just said, look, that's we're not going there yet. Yeah. Um, but I think they'll 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 be, um, I think they'll be forced to consider the issue at some stage. Oh, I don't. Oh, that's so far from what I do. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't really understand a lot of the issues except for the fact that you you know the bottom line is you've got to get stem cells from somewhere yeah yeah um and it's it's a case of where do you get them from yeah it so. does seem um it does seem kind of crazy if you can get them i mean the ethics behind it i think i i don't even i don't know that i personally agree with them anyway like with a baby's a baby when it's like there's i feel like there is a pretty clear time when you can see something is a you know a baby um but there's so many ways that they can get stem cells now i think people have like a an, an old school uh maybe thinking of like how they actually get it. it's not like they're like there's a fetus and then they're like taking all the blood out of it and throwing away the baby like, i think it's like blown out of proportion a little bit oh quite possibly yeah yeah, yeah. but but at some stage that, that's an issue they're gonna have to tackle you know they yeah because they, they, there's crazy potential uh, yeah they they do sell products that they say are stem cells. Like the, the classic one is um, uh, where um, 
you know, there, there are low levels of stem cells through, yep. you know, your fat and your skin and... and but they and, they and do uh, bone marrow as well. You can do bone marrow aspirate and try and get something out of that. I think my understanding is, that, and, and mine's very rudimentary, it's yeah. not what I do, but uh, it's about volume. You know, you, you do one of those processes and you might get a very small number of stem cells, like yep. tiny. Yeah. When you want to fill a, a defect like that in your tendon... You know, a that's decent millions size. And millions of cells. Need millions of them. Yeah, yeah. and okay. that and that's why they're looking at alternative things like slightly less. Um, you know, they're getting a tenocyte rather than a stem cell. Yeah, and they're okay. heading down that path. It's it's about um, being able to provide the volume. You yeah. know, so it's all very well to say you know you've got stem cells in your skin, but you're prepared to give up all your skin to get it. Yeah, yeah. probably yeah. not. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So if the clavicle is the most common motocross injury what other ones are we looking oh, at that you're seeing all the time look we see um, a lot of wrist fractures and, and to be honest the motocross riders seem to do a different pattern of fracture to the, the norm yep. they're not the only ones that do it but I think it's the velocity or the, the, the you know, they probably break a lot of them on the handlebars and, and they almost shear the end off their radius and so their wrist so they get these very distal fractures with not a lot of bone it's almost just the joint surface yeah on them um they can be challenging to fix because it's hard to get fixation into that yeah and hold it and make it stable um and so you do see a fair few of those um we see um scaphoids as well scaphoids yeah and there's been a few of those well, you know you've famous seen, ones yeah you've seen maddie's <laughs> you've yeah. done maddie's one his is pretty cooked yeah yeah and um or Toby's, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah, we've we've fixed at some stage. So there, there are scaphoid fractures. Um, oh, look, the odd el- elbow fracture, humeral fracture. It's not uncommon for them to come in. You know, they've landed heavily and they've got you know scapula, humerus, clavicle all in one. You yeah. know, that happens from time to time. A couple of ribs underneath it. So. Yeah. Um, we treat a few forearm pumps. You know that. Are, I was going to actually ask you about that. So what what is if, if we could uh, yeah, paint the picture of like what's going on there, what that surgery is aiming to do and like how effective that is because that's uh, obviously one of the more common, uh, I guess, themes to deal with in motocross is riders getting arm pumps. So what exactly yeah. is going on there? Well, look, arm pump's really common. Like, and I think anybody that rides for long enough probably gets it, <laughs> you know. So um, what what's happening is that it's, it's a normal process – when you're um, using your forearm muscles for that period of time or any any of your muscles to get some swelling in the compartment. So you get increased fluid in there. Now, the, the problem with that is that uh, your compartment, your muscles within your leg or your arm or anyway, are covered by a fascia. So it's almost like a sausage skin yep. around the outside of them. That helps them function better and contract harder and all those sorts of things. Um, but it's, it's like a sausage skin. And if you keep pushing fluid in, you can actually get to a point where um, the blood vessels can't pump through it. So, you, so you're actually getting enough pressure in there that it's stopping blood flow. Yeah, okay. And and the guys that are getting to that stage where they're, you know, cramping up and they can't move their hand, you know, they it's usually very reproducible too. Like the guys that get really good, good going forearm pump will say, um, and especially when you see the super bike riders, that they'll say on that circuit it comes on on lap four. Mm. They can tell you exactly when it's going to happen, and they say I'm, I'm, I'll be winning or I'll be coming top five, and I hit lap four. I cramp, you know, cramp up. I can't really move anything. My forearms go rock hard, and and I can't ride anymore. And I drop back through the field, and I end up dead last or whatever it might be. Yeah. And they and they can tell you where it happens. They so they can almost point to the corner usually and say it happens there on lap five. Because they know how long it takes to build up that pressure mm. in their compartment. So uh, the compartment's like a sealed unit. If you keep accumulating fluid in there, eventually you get so much pressure that you, you can't actually uh, pump through there. So people get a thing called an acute compartment syndrome. So the classic that's when you fracture a tibia, say, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and the bleeding into the compartment does the same thing. And so that becomes a bit of an emergency. You've got to get to theatre and release the pressure in the compartments. Or, That's or, a crazy surgery, eh? Oh, yeah, yeah. And it's um because you, you, your muscles aren't getting any oxygen, so they're going to die. So yeah. you have to open the compartment up and give them room to swell so the blood vessels can you know supply enough oxygen that they survive. So you usually end up with big cuts on both sides of your leg and opening up all the compartments and letting the muscles just bulge out. 
and then over a period of a few days or a week, you, you slowly close those wounds. As the pressure comes down, you might have to go back to theatre a few times and you slowly bring them together. Sometimes we even bootlace them. So you, you'll put staples down either side of the wound and and um, run like an elastic band backwards and forwards. So it's like a crisscross bootlace. Yeah. And each time you go back, you pull the Just bootlace and squeeze it together a bit further and then you do it a bit further and then eventually the skin will come together. If it doesn't, you might have to graft it, but most of them come back together. So that's for an acute compartment syndrome. Um, is there any when you so the fascia yep. then is not getting joined back together or no, what, what you, happens to you, the fascia? You, you let it go, and sometimes your muscles will bulge out and look a bit. The contour of your leg might look slightly different, or yeah, um, you you don't generally repair that because it'll be too tight. Basically, yep. you go so. What it's like trying pump to put is, an Ikea thing back in the box once you've taken it all out. You'll just never get it back in there. Pretty or a much. swag. Like pretty the swag, much. you know, when you buy a swag and you pull the thing, it's never going back in there. Exactly. Like. <laughs> much the same. So um, what forearm pump is, is, a, is a chronic version of that. So what you're doing is you're riding until you're getting enough swelling in the compartment that it, it stops. Uh, it stops the inflow of blood and the oxygen and say so you're actually getting ischemia in that compartment but that's when you cramp up and you can't ride anymore and the race finishes and, you, and then, and then goes you goes back down and then slowly. You, you go and see your team they start to milk it out and then and then it it recovers you know and so hopefully you get right for the next race um so it's a chronic version of that the difference is that you don't have uncontrolled bleeding into it so once yeah. you stop exercising yep. it you can get rid of the fluid so it's just and basically the same thing as when you have the, it's the same thing yeah. it's just a gentler version of it that you wow. that you it's can control yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I've actually um, taken the uh, there's a pressure monitor that you can poke into the compartment measure what the pressure is really and um, I actually took it to the track one day for a couple of guys that had bad forearm pump and I said as soon as you finish the race come into race safe and we'll stick it in and we measured their pressures they were huge what kind of pressures are you talking oh, about sort of 40 millimeters of mercury which is about the the point where with an acute compartment syndrome you think it's time to go to theater and release it so wow. they're actually getting those sort of pressures um difference is they can stop it what, what, and, then, and then milk it out and, what's and, like a resting pressure oh almost nothing like a couple really? of millimeters yeah wow yeah. so it's um you know they're getting big pressures in their form they come in and you yours are probably the same when you ride they rock hard like yep. your forearm goes hard yeah if you put a needle in or if you at that point where you're not getting blood flow well the pressure's high enough in there that it's stopping enough blood flowing in so it's a decent pressure you'd be up around 30 or 40 so um at that point that's when you can't hang on anymore well you then stop you stop yeah you stop and the process stops and you, you try to get them right and and away you go again well that obviously, if it's if it's happening on lap five every time you go around, well, you, you're not going to be competitive. So, yeah. so that's when you try and manage them. It's obviously and much better if you can manage it than to have surgery. And and I usually say to patients, look, what are you trying? Are you you know doing massage and all those sorts of things? Um, you, you've got to try um, to probably relax on as much as you can on the bars. You know, you see guys lined up for the start. And they're gripping the handlebars as tight as they can, yeah. and they they don't blink, and they yeah, you know yeah. you, you've seen the guys, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. and and uh, that's probably not conducive to looking after your your forearm pressures. Yeah, you got to relax and have them on the. It's easier said than done. I'm not a racer, but, yeah, you know, yeah. But that's why I say to them, I say you, when you can relax, you got to relax and not not be gripping the bars like you're trying to squeeze the you know the rubber off the end of the handlebars or you know so you've got to try and relax as much as you can when you can because there's times when you can't yeah and and look after them and look if if they go through all that and they're doing the massage and 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 it's not holding them and they can't race with it well then we talk to them about surgery and essentially the surgery is to split the sausage skin and it's like no different to the sausage on the barbecue if it splits along well, if you run a knife along the top of it, all the all the sausage meat bul bulges out through the through the split. That's essentially what we do to your forearm. So we we um, so, you know small skin incision, but then elevate the skin, and the fat off the fascia, make sure we're safe, and then and then split the fascia all the way down, and so the muscles can bulge out through there. And, and look, most of the guys we do it on notice a, a big difference early. You know, the first couple of races, they go, this is fantastic. Um, and then they're pretty good for a few seasons, but they often, if you see them later, they say uh, eventually the symptoms come back again. And that's because oh, really? your body just fills that in with scar. And, and the scar is probably even less pliable than the, than the fascia. Than the fascia. So, um, 
I, I warn all the patients that have it done, they will probably get the symptoms back at some stage. Yeah. Um, and, and I think most of them do. So it's not a permanent cure, unfortunately, but yeah. uh, it does help. Like it's certainly, most of the riders that have it done notice like the next week when they ride, they feel great. Yeah, because you can basically ride straight away yeah. after yeah. it. Yeah. The one thing I do tell them though is it's not going to stop the swelling. The swelling is normal. Yeah. It just stops the pressure build up. So yeah. you'll still come off, your, uh, your forearms will still be swollen Rock and hard. big. They're just not they're in not, a case. They're just not in a sausage case. So mm. they, they'll, they'll be squishy and you know, you've know you got to get in and you've still got to manage them. You've still got to milk them out and you've got to get rid of the fluid out of your forearms and before you go out and ride again, they just don't get that ischemic cramp up mm. mid-race. So what about when you're... So this was... I just raced Manji on the weekend. Mm. I don't really get the forearm pump um ever since i started doing jujitsu actually that mm. i i think it's so hard on your arms like i used to when i first started doing jujitsu i'd get like crazy bad arm pump like way mm. worse than i ever got on a moto yeah like right. literally like locking up because it's it's gripping yeah. so hard and you're gripping fabric yep um and it's like a a real isometric hold sometimes you know like sometimes you've got the same grip for five minutes mm. just not like a rodeo you know like yeah. holding on um and then it went away a lot over time though um and to now to where i really don't struggle with like forearm pump or anything like that like uh but i get cramps in my or like pain in my hands like across my palm I wonder if what like what that is. I don't know if that's any something that's like common or uncommon or just yeah. like a lack lack of conditioning maybe. But yeah, well I get like a line of pain across my palm now. Yeah, don't know. You'd have to actually have a look at it and see, I think, and, and yeah. try and work it out. Rule things out, like make sure it's not a bit of carpal tunnel syndrome. Mm. Uh, make sure you're not got flexor synovitis, you know, that you, from repetitive gripping through there, you know, oh, okay. make sure you're you're not getting a bit of low grade forearm pump or yeah. Whatever it is, I'm not sure. It's they're hard to work out sometimes. Those things. What what is carpal tunnel syndrome? Um, it, it's it's a um, compressive neuropathy. So you've got um, you've got two main nerves going to your hand um, to control the feeling and the muscle, small muscles in your hand. You have got your median nerve and your ulnar nerve. Yeah. And they've got to get from your forearm into your hand, and they've basically got to go through tunnels. So there's two tunnels there. There's Guillon's canal and there's your carpal tunnel. Yeah. So your ulnar nerve and your ulnar artery go down Guillon's canal and your median nerve and nine of your tendons to your thumb and your fingers go down your carpal tunnel. Now, if your carpal tunnel is a bit too small or it's being swollen or it's being constricted by something or you've had a fracture and there's a bit of bone sticking into it or a carpal bone or you know one of those sorts of things, that tunnel's not big enough to house nine tendons in the nerve yeah. and and you, you'll end up squashing the nerve. The nerve's less resilient than the tendons to that pressure yep. and ischemia and so your nerve just won't get enough oxygen to it because it's being squashed and the little fine blood vessels on the outside of it that supply the blood and the oxygen to the nerve are, are, are being squashed and so there's just nothing getting there. So you're actually getting ischemic changes in your nerve and so you're getting numbness and pain and tingling and weakness and 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 it might be intermittent and mild or right through to the nerves being severely squashed and and it's actually dying and you're not getting you know you're getting um uh, nerve fiber dropout so as, as they're not getting enough oxygen they're actually dying so it can be anything from one end to the other the treatment's to make the tunnel bigger really so you do an operation to cut the ligament the tunnel's made up of your little your carpal bones so your little wrist bones which in that plane form almost like a c shape yeah and you've got a flat ligament across the front so you've almost got like a D-shaped space. Yeah, yeah. And what we do is just split the ligament so that it opens up and you've got a bigger, rounder space. Over time, that fills in with scar tissue, and um, but you've still got a, a bigger space there for the nerve to run and, and less pressure on it. Yeah, right. What are the most common causes of the carpal tunnel? Um, well, being female, overweight, and diabetes are your three most common. Really? Yeah, but you do Why see it with female? a lot of other. Uh, probably because they're anatomically smaller in the wrist, so they've just got uh, less room. Yeah, so, okay. Yeah. So it's just like a bit of a shitty design. Probably, yeah. Yeah, Yeah. that's bizarre. If you had a chance to go back to the drawing board, you'd probably do it slightly differently. Uh, there's probably so much stuff in the human body that's like that. Yeah, yeah, that you look at and go, I'm not quite sure why it's like that, but it's just a developmental thing and that's that's the way it is. That's so, like, like the, I guess, the scaphoid not getting having its own blood supply. Yeah, scaphoid's a, an interesting bone because it, it, it's... Um, the way it articulates, so if you actually take one out and look at it in your hand, it's almost 
all cartilage. So mm. it articulates everywhere. So anywhere you've got cartilage, you've got, you, you can't get a blood vessel into the bone. So mm. so one end of it, the proximal end, so the end closest to your your elbow. Pull up a scaphoid on the on the TV. S C H A P C A P H O I D. O I D. Yeah. That's Chappelle Corby. No. <laughs> <laughs> you, you don't need the, you don't need the first H in there. Uh, S C S C A A P H O I D bone. There you go. So is there a picture of actually one there? Uh, we'll get the doctor to pick the right picture, I reckon. Think she isn't just oh. Yeah, there isn't a picture of a scaphoid sitting there. There's lots of x-rays of them, but... Just go, um, uh, just try... Uh, just scroll down, Goof, maybe. Raw. You, you could just use the, the diagram there over on... Yeah, that one. No, next one on the left. Which it, it doesn't. It doesn't actually really show what we're talking about there because it's a pretty obscure little bone, isn't it? Yeah, it's only a small bone. as all your carpal bones are. There? Yeah, that'll be all right. Go left, Griff. Left, left. No. Right. One. Yeah. Try yeah. that. Try that one. So it's a bone that's almost completely surrounded by other bones, and if you imagine that the white that they've drawn there is so meant, to, meant the to be the cartilage. Yeah. Okay. So there isn't much space. It's, yeah. For, for yeah, vessels to yeah, get in. Yeah. So. Most of the blood supply comes at the distal end, so the end closest to your fingers. So and you can see less cartilage up there. Yeah, on there's, that end, there's yeah. a couple of spots where where blood vessels can get in. But if you break it, the the, the further proximal you break it, yeah. the more the chance that that proximal bit's got no blood supply. Mm. And so, most of the time, we can get two live bits of bone to join together. It's harder to get a live bit of bone to join to a dead bit of bone. Mm. Now, if you can achieve it it will revascularize and it'll actually go through a process of healing that side and it'll come back fine but you've got to, it's harder to get live bone to join to dead bone than it is live bone to live bone is it like uh now this is just me not knowing anything is it like when you let's say you got a little bit of timber and you're using like a big drill bit and it's like right to the end of a bit of timber and you drill through and it's going to split the the wood is that a similar thing that's happening with a bone or like is that like the worry kind of look that that can happen when you're trying to fix a lot of fractures because um if you've got a bad fracture of say a long bone like a you know a humerus or a femur or, and you know we said before that you know you might go in thinking it's in six pieces but it's in 26 pieces yeah and that's when you get in there and um there might be six pieces but each of those pieces might have sort of stress you know fractures across them you know like with mm. microscopic fracture lines and as you start to try and drill it if you're not careful that might then split into mm. four bits and then you try to drill those and they split into four bits and so it can be a challenge at times yeah yeah scaphoid not so much like that the challenge with the scaphoid is the blood supply mm. and and um there's a lot of them if they're displaced or they're or distracted or they just don't heal yeah um it, it's also enclosed in a synovial space now one of the things synovial fluid does in a joint is dissolve clot so for something to heal you need bleeding and you need uh, a clot to form you to clot. and you need you know either your osteocytes or your fibroblasts depending on what it's trying to heal yeah it has to grow through that and form either scar or bone or um one of the one of the problems you get with something inside a joint is that synovial fluid, so the lubricating fluid in your joint, actually dissolves it that goes, clot. Yeah. Because if it didn't, every time you had a bleed into a joint, it would fibrose and you'd never and move you'd that never joint again. Yeah. So it's a very useful property. But in this context, it but in works this context, actually healing. works against you. So, yeah. so that's why an ACL doesn't heal. You tear your medial ligament. It'll generally heal. You go into a splint. You'd, most of the time, you don't need surgery. That's why MCLs repair themselves. And ACLs the don't. Ah. MCLs outside the joint. ACLs inside the joint. So it's wow. bathed in synovial fluid. It just cannot join back up again because ah. you don't get that process occurring. So usually, if you tear an ACL, you've either got to live without it or get a have a reconstruction. Yeah. So because yeah. it's inside the joint, it, it generally won't heal. Huh. Um, so, and it's the same problem here. You've got a fracture of a bone that's contained inside a joint. It's synovialized. One end's probably not got great blood supply. The challenge is to get it to heal. And and even when you do everything right, some of them don't heal. Yeah. And that, and that can be a problem. And then you might have to do a vascularized bone graft, so a live piece of bone in there. 
or you might eventually have to do a salvage procedure where you take the scaphoid out and do something else like a full corner fusion or a proximal row carpectomy or there's, there's ways of salvaging that situation but yeah. it's much better if you can get your get your uh, fracture to heal so maddie's in that um obviously maddie's going to be cool with us talking about uh his injury but maddie's kind of in that boat where uh, his scaphoid was just a complete mess and now he's dealing with a lot of dead bone and yeah. basically he's basically just topping himself up with cortisone injections uh, to get through because he's looking until at he's some, ready some the salvage kind of procedure yeah. yeah okay yeah so um you know, one of the things is that, yes the dead bone crumbles but then your scaphoid also forms a link between the rows of your carpus and so if that dies or if it doesn't heal that will often um, actually begin to flex and so your whole carpus changes shape and it collapses slightly and that's a condition we call a snack wrist so it's a yeah, what was the scaphoid non-union advanced collapse? So uh, it'll cause your your carpus, so your little wrist bones, to actually move and sit in the wrong position, and it'll lead you not only to getting arthritis where the scaphoid yeah. is, but you'll get arthritis through, through your wrist. Your wrist. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And so, what what kind of like? I think Maddie's probably looking at some kind of fusion. Like, what's the movement and stuff you end up getting without that? Is that is that a, a shitty thing to have to live with? Uh they're not too bad. They certainly, you know, and a lot of people will choose that over having a, a total fusion. You know, if you fuse it, you got no movement, yeah. and that's especially hard if you want to ride, ride motorbikes. You, you end up with the big chicken arm out there. Yeah, yeah. It's a it's a very hard thing to do a throttle when you've got a fused wrist. So. Um, most of the riders will choose to have some sort of motion sparing procedure and, and the, the two most common ones are to either take the scaphoid out and fuse the other um, four main bones that you see so your capitate and your lunate and your triquetrum your hamate fuse them together yeah. and make it one bone and that way it can't collapse yeah. and it'll just bear through your lunate predominantly on, on your lunate fossa and so um, and, and look, usually you get about 50% reduction in motion with that because Which you're is, getting rid of one of the two yeah. articulations, so you lose about half. Yeah, okay. It's not bad. It's it's better than nothing. Yeah. Um, and, and it's usually a pretty reliable operation. The other one is that you can take out the proximal row bone, so take out the scaphoid and the lunate and the um, uh, triquetrum and let your capitate articulate on there on the radius and so just shorten the wrist by one row and let it come back and that, yeah, that right. can work as well and sometimes we even put in one a little pyrocarbon prosthesis if there's some damage there as well yeah you know we looked at that pyrocarbon before they make them for wrist joints as yeah, well so i was going to ask that like is there a way that you could insert a prosthetic scaphoid bone there is and they make them the problem is um it, it only fixes one problem it fixes the fracture and the deterioration in it because you've replaced it with with an artificial one it doesn't fix the problem of the collapse of the carpus yeah, generally because right. it's not linked to anything. Yeah. And so without a sca functioning scaphoid ligament and your proximal row will tend, tend to still go into that collapsed position. And so it only half fixes the problem. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, explain yeah, the problem? Yeah, 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 it does. Yeah, because like you would just assume that if you could put in a prosthetic and then attach all the ligaments to it, but then I guess like how are you attaching the ligaments to the prosthetic? How do you get it to heal to it? How do you, there's so many layers there, but but yeah, that's that's where it's headed. And and if you can if they can develop that material and that prosthesis, yeah, yeah, yeah. So when you do, um, I think I saw it on your Instagram or website maybe where um, there was a AC join that you did or maybe it was on toby's ac yeah you actually it actually used it looked just like a string like you just tied the joint back yeah. together it's a bit it's a similar process to probably people have heard of a lars ligament yeah, like, which knee. is yeah. for the knee to try and when you when you don't want to use graft you can actually use an artificial yeah graft for the acl this is a very similar product it's a braided polyester um, How do we bring that up? It's really cool to look if, at. If you if you type in um, lockdown surgery league, there'll be something in there. Lockdown. How do you spell that? G I L I G. I think it is. S U R G I L I G. See what comes up there. Oh, there yeah, you go. There you go. Um, and it, it's a it's a braided polyester. They're all handmade, wow. so the. You know, there's a little factory where they all sit down and hand braid them like a wow, like a you know making a friendship bracelet or something. Yeah, they all sit yeah, there, yeah, yeah. and and the, the tolerance is obviously pretty you know um, 
low. They, they they make them. They all look the same when they come out. They're pretty close. Yeah, and uh, that's amazing. And so you can see that um, what you're trying to reconstruct is the ligaments that are running between your coracoid and your clavicle. So which which one's a good example? Of that? Um, probably if you hop onto that one. Um, and, and so you, you, you're trying to reconstruct those so ligaments. So that's, that that's what's happening when your AC joint yeah, pops. Yeah, so you've essentially, it's a very simplistic diagram, but yes, you've ruptured your, your conoid and your trapezoid ligament that run from your coracoid up to your clavicle. Yeah. And so the two then just separate. So that doesn't actually sit in a socket. Oh, it does. So there, there is a joint there as well, okay, but it's okay. an odd sort of joint. Yeah. But the main restraining ligaments actually come off further back from the edge of the joint. And so if you've ruptured those, um, what we tend to do is, is um, there, there are different ways of doing it. You can screw the two together, but those are meant to move on each other. So at some point you've got to take those out. So the, the transition has been more to using this sort of construct. That makes so a lot of sense when you look at it. Yeah, yeah, you're trying to recreate Doesn't, it. Yeah, yeah. It's made, it, made out of a braided um, polyester. And, and hopefully what happens is um, the patient's scar tissue forms around it and through it and it becomes sort of like a half, part of you in a sense. half human, half yeah, polyester yeah. ligament. And we often take the ligament next to it that you can see running from your coracoid up to your acromion, the, the longer one there. We actually often take that and sew that into the end of the uh, um, oh, structure so like as you well. bring it like... Oh, just you, you don't necessarily need your coraco uh, acromial ligament, so we'll often use it to augment that. So you end up with some polyester, hopefully a lot of scar, plus your own coraco acromial ligament transferred over to become a coraco clavicular ligament. Yeah, right. And so we often try and do all those three. That's but, amazing. Yeah, yeah, no, and it generally it's a pretty reliable operation. You know, we um, a lot of the, another one we do a lot on on motocross, motocross riders. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Probably seen more of those on the enduro you, that guys. That was on Maddie too. Maddie did that when you did his shoulder. He's had exactly that done. Oh, yeah. Has he got one of them in him? I think he does from memory. I'd have to have a oh, look, but I think cool. he does. Yeah, because wow, his was bad, eh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh. No, I think that's. I'd have to I'd have to look at his notes, but I think that's what we did to him from memory. Yeah, he wouldn't even know that. He would have probably have no idea. I would have shown him on a model. Yeah, and, yeah, and, but, but mate, it 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 goes out. Yeah, you're saying. Right. Cool, fix me. It really does. And there's actually been studies on that where they, they look at people coming in for a medical consult. Yeah. And most patients have something they want answered. You know, it's often a, you know, mm. is this fixable? Can I ride have I got cancer? Week? Can yeah. I ride next week? Whatever it is. Yeah. Once you've answered that question, that the patient's the retention is yeah. very poor after yeah. that. And it's one of the reasons I often encourage them to bring someone in with them, you yeah. know, like a partner like or a mum or a dad yeah. or, yeah, yeah, exactly. So, um, it's it's often a positive thing because they'll go home and say, "Remember when Doc said that?" And they go, mm -mm. "No, I don't remember that," because they've switched off at that point. And yeah. and it's just human nature. You can't. That's the way it is. Yeah. Sometimes if you're doing something really big on people, you, you'll get them to come back again and have another appointment with you. Yeah. They, they look at you and say, "Well, why?" And you go, well, "We just need to talk about it again." Yeah. You know, so that you can. Because I can, I know you're not going to absorb it all in one go. Yeah, yeah. Because you've switched off when you when I told you it was fixable. You yeah. know, so and that just oh. turns into big word, big word, big word, big word. Yeah, exactly. So, so look, that's that's what we tend to do with these. That's and super cool. Yeah, Toby's was a bit of a challenge. And once again, I've spoke yeah, to Toby. Yeah. He's happy for us to have a chat, and and it's it's all over, you know, social Talking media and things. Share, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, his was a bit of a challenge because he'd had a previous injury, and then he had his. He's off at um, Dakar and we, we got him home. And when we got in there... He, so was this the year through um, through COVID and you guys, yeah. he ended up doing his quarantine in... In the PA hospital. So you, guys, yeah. you guys actually did a lot more for Tobes than just do the surgery. Like it, it was actually... Common. Oh, we got him home essentially. Yeah, pretty yeah. much... Yeah. yeah. How, what, how was that like just dealing with that process? Yeah. Uh, it was all right. Like we just had to make lots of phone calls and ring and find out how can we get him here. How does he actually get through? That's Where so does he cool. have to quarantine? Like I was on the phone, like a few days in a row with the health minister and you know various things. Really, you know, just chatting to him, saying like, what, "What do we do here?" Yeah, yeah. You know, so and and to be fair, they did everything they could possibly do to make it work for him too. Like it was it was a lot of steps in that process. You know. Um, you know, PA hospital bent over backwards, the health department bent over backwards, you know, like just didn't bend rules, just made it work for him. Yeah, yeah. You know, so um, he, unfortunately for him, had to do his quarantine at, in, in a very yeah. small hospital room. Yeah. Um, I, I went up to see him a couple of times and um, 
Red Bull bought him a few toys and things to use, for yeah. it, uh, but it's still a pretty small room. So we got him through that, and then we did his surgery. When we got in there, he'd, he'd obviously had an old fracture and a new fracture of the end of his clavicle and an AC joint injury. Yeah. And everything was sort of a few weeks down the track at that stage and pretty soft and mushy. So we put a, um, a small plate across the top of his clavicle because the clavicle really wasn't in good enough condition to do that too. It would have... It was too soft, yeah. essentially. So um, we put a small plate on. So and what then, does that mean, soft? Oh, healing fracture. So okay. it was sort of half-healed fracture fragments across there. What does that look like? Um, it, it's sort of... Um, the bone, when you go in and you've got a fracture that's sort of healing, the, the, it will often have some new bone which is not organised properly, so it's a bit soft. Yeah. And often the bone that is intact will often be softer as well because it had no load put through it and it's, yeah. there's this healing process going on. Well, Toby's distal clavicle was very soft and so we put a plate across the top of it to sort of buttress it and then did the graft around there. But unfortunately... Um, the, the the problem with that was that it, it actually sawed its way through the graft, yeah, and so right. um, he started to get a, a a bit of a synovial fluid collection, which we drained. Which in hindsight was because it was starting to saw through the graft, but then he eventually sawed right through it, and it and it failed. So the actual ligament itself, the re, the ligament actually the new it's, ligament it's like ripped a, through the bone. No, no, no. The 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 plate sawed through the ligament. Oh. So okay. it's like a you know running yeah, a rope yeah, over yeah. the edge of a cliff. It, yeah, it eventually yeah. just frayed and and gave way. So so how do you fix that? Well, we went back in and put a new ligament in, but by then the bone had healed and so it was solid. So I just out. took the plate out and wrapped it round, and oh. and and he's had a great result. It's going really well, but it took longer than he obviously wanted to get it to heal. So. Um, you know, he, he wanted to be back for Fink that he year. He wanted to do the bike that year, but he couldn't. I man. think he wanted to do the bike car yeah, combo. Yeah. And he and he decided. I think he took the bike and did a bit of riding, but he uh, he didn't race the bike. Mm. But he um he won the car. He won the trophy trucks that year. Yeah. Yeah. So so is that why? I guess it's ideal to operate on a bone as soon as it breaks because it hasn't had a chance to go soft in that in that oh, sense. It can be. Yeah. It's it's nicer to fix fractures when they're pretty fresh um, because everything's a bit looser. Everything gets a bit sort of tight yep. and um, the, the, the fracture fragments start to remodel. And so it's a bit like a jigsaw puzzle yep. where all the corners are a bit dinged. Yeah. Nothing quite pieces uh, together properly. Yeah, 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 Whereas yeah. a fresh fracture keys in beautifully and you can you can get it together and you sort of think, oh, yeah, I, I made a new clavicle there. You know, and yeah. you, you feel pretty good about yourself when it's all a bit old and it's half united and you unpick it, it doesn't quite piece together the same. It's a bit like doing a, a dud jigsaw puzzle where it's, the dog's chewed a couple of the pieces and yep. it doesn't quite fit together. And you can't, this is, might be the most dumb question ever, but it's not like you can just like file it back so it's just like two nice bits that... You can if you've got enough length. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, and we do sometimes do that with fractures. We might actually just like if it's all jagged trim the ends and, and, and yep. get them together. But... You're losing length when you do that, so you've yeah. got to, it's got to be somewhere where you've got the length to spare, or so you, it's not something you do routinely for most fractures. Um, you, you, what you want to do most of the time is restore length and, and mm. make sure it's the right length. Yeah. You know, especially say for you know a, a two bone construct like your forearm, if you take length one out, out of one, you know. it doesn't work. So you, you've got to try and get them the right length most of the time. So yeah, because I think with my collarbone, with the way that it healed, like it's definitely shorter. Oh, than, probably will be. Than yeah. it would have been, and I could feel like years after I did it, and probably now I feel like I actually have a lot of problems with like my like chest being real tight. Yeah, and I feel like it's probably because it's just on like a different angle than it than it's supposed to be. Um, I mean, at least that's sort of what it makes sense to me. Yeah, the the when I see patients with clavicle fracture, I mean, if we work out, um, you know, what their goals are, and you know, if if I've got a say a motocross rider comes in and says oh god I'm having a terrible season I'm coming last and I broke my clavicle and you look at it it doesn't really need fixing I'll say how about you just let it heal yeah, you know, yeah. so you don't there's nothing to be gained by us doing that and and, and any operation has some risk attached to it so yeah. if you can avoid it it's good so um, but one of the things we do talk to patients about if, if you're more than a couple of centimetres short with your clavicle um there is some there is some evidence that it does affect your function a little bit if you're really short. Yeah. Um, the other issue is you actually look funny. 
Yeah, you yeah. know, and, and you, I'll often take, um, you know, young patients. You know, if we get a teenager with a clavicle fracture, I'll often take them in with mum and dad and stand them in front of a mirror and say, "That's where you're going to look like with your shoulder short, or it's out." And yeah. you're showing them it doesn't look funny. You know, they're out to length and saying, you know, that's how you're going to look. Are you happy with that? Yeah, right. And and it often is a bit of an eye opener for them. They look and go, "Yeah, that looks funny, doesn't it?" You know, they might have one shoulder. Yeah. You know, in significantly you know and they, they don't like it so um it, it's just one of the one of the factors you consider when you, you're trying to work out whether they need surgery or not yeah and you said something before about uh the bone going soft from not having load on it i was reading a book it wasn't a um it was actually uh i guess it's more of a philosophy book and the same taleb called it's called anti-fragile and it's like this concept that he has uh it's, it was a really good book but he spoke he used this uh bone analogy and and in the book and this is where i don't know if it's true or not but he was saying that i guess the old thinking of bone degeneration is it just comes with age but he was saying that a lot of the new science around bone degeneration is basically that once you stop putting load through bones that's when they start to degenerate is that true in saying there is an element in that yeah there are there are other factors like hormonal things and and that where bone resorbs and and, yeah. yeah Um, you know, going through menopause, obviously you lose a lot of bone mass. And but one of the things is that through the hormones, like that you're not giving you the same, or it's just that yeah, general cell. No, it's like, hormonal thing. Yeah. Okay. So, um, and that's why they do hormone replacement therapy. Yeah, yeah. You know, to replace that, so that your bones don't weaken. Yeah. Um, or as much anyway. Um, th- there is an element of truth to that in, the, in that some of the best exercise you can do as you age is not necessarily walking and cardio it's actually load bearing and, and and there's a trend towards that at the moment that's of, what this book basically kept on with yeah 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 and the, there is some good evidence that come and uh, coming out to show that um some of the older people are probably better off going to the gym and exercising and squats than going and, for a walk yeah, yeah it doesn't have to have massive weight on there you just got to load the bones load the bones yeah and it, and it probably does help so um there's some interesting um research they've done at stage where if you orient a bone say this way and load it longitudinally um your bone is not a dead structure it's not a tube of steel it's yeah. a, it's a living um part of your body so your um, cells within that bone will actually line up the um, cancellous bone. So the outside of your bone is a is a is a thick wall, yep. and inside the strength it comes from like honeycomb type bone, say so cancellous bone. Really, and and the the that will respond to force. So if you put force through a bone this way, it will line up those um oh, they, like basically directly vertical with the force to line up to take the force they yeah. actually often line up in arches but but it, it's a very clever way you know in that it will take the load wow. coming this way if you then take that load off and put it this way you know from you know 90 degrees to that your, your cells will actually start to remodel that and take that down and build the the, the structure going across to take really? the load that way so it responds to force so it's a living um responsive um, you know, uh, organ in your body. You yeah. know, so so if you continue in as you age to load it, it's going to keep responding. To it'll force. keep responding. So yeah. it helps. It's not the only factor, but it it certainly helps. Yeah, that's so cool. You, I mean, so many of uh, I guess the just when it comes to like physiology and anatomy is just like the scale that you're looking at it essentially you know like you said you go deeper and deeper and deeper or closer to it then you start to see the different frameworks just from the outside you know uh, you're holding a a humerus bone in your hands it's like it would look like one particular structure but you know you zoom all the way into it there's so much going on inside there. there's cells there's you know and and the question then is how does that respond like why do they do that Mm. and and if you could work the science of that out then you might be able to stimulate those cells to make bone you know yeah. so there's, there's there's huge amounts of you know research can go into it and and hopefully in time you end up with better and better understanding of it and then that leads to ability to accelerate fracture healing which would be fantastic yeah um but yeah it'll come what's uh what's some of the worst injuries you've seen from motocross just nightmare situations oh that um, you've had to kind of operate on and try and get working again? Well, there's certainly been some bad um, scapular fractures and things. There's been some challenging things like um, 
Well, one of those is Toby Scaford when he came back from mm. from uh, South America with a, you know he had his win in was that twenty nineteen? Mm-hmm. You remember the dates better than I do? Yeah, yeah. I think it was twenty nineteen. <laughs> yeah, so um, you know that, that was challenging because he had no bone left. You know, really? so he had because um, what he'd done, he, he, he fractured his scaphoid mid waist, and 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 so mm. about mid scaphoid, and I can see what they were trying to do. They they thought if we do a big operation here, he's not going to be able to ride at Dakar. So they tried to put a percutaneous screw in um, to just basically through a little tiny incision, line it up on an X-ray on an I.O. machine, so they can see and fire a screw down through the bone. The, the problem is it probably never had quite enough hold and, and probably were, were, was never quite reduced either. I never understood so, when you would see x-rays like what you're describing where they just drill and put a screw in between the bone. Like, what are they trying to achieve there? Well, the, what they're, they're putting in is a screw um, with a... So you're trying to stabilise the fracture, basically, is what you're trying to do, and compress it. So if you can hold the two posters of bone steady and squeeze them against each other there's a reasonable chance you can get them to heal now so they're hoping that the thread of the screw when it's like tightened in actually compresses yeah the- they're an interesting processes though so um they're a thing called a headless bone screw and the first one was designed by a fellow named tim look, herbert look, look that up griff a headless bone screw and and if you look at one um it's a great little bit of engineering in that the yeah, thre- i never understood how this would work the thread at one end has a steeper pitch than the thread at the other end and so as you screw it through bone, the tip is traveling faster through the distal end than the proximal end is traveling through the proximal end. And so as you're screwing it, it's actually squeezing the two ends together. So that's how it works. So if you look, um, oh, look, there's a good example. If you pick, um, well, maybe pick that one because it looks quite extreme there. So you can see that one end's got very uh, narrow pitch yep. and the other end's got a very broad pitch. Now that one hasn't got a lot of lot of um, thread on it, but um, the ones we use look probably more like that. Actually, one just in the middle next to it. So if you, yeah, no, the next one. So no, no, the other way. Yep. And so as you tighten it, the distal end, so the, or or the the tip end here is travelling further through one piece of bone or faster as per turn than the proximal end. So as you tighten yeah, it. Yeah it's actually helping to bring the two ends of bone together. And is it going long ways through the bone, not to yeah. re- like straight down? You're firing it, uh, what you're trying to fire is pretty much straight across the fracture. So as you tighten it, it's squeezing those two ends together okay. is the plan. Um, and, and look, that's what they tried with Toby. And, and I can see why they did that. Where was that yeah. operation? Uh, I think in Morocco. Yeah, so it wasn't here. No, 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 no. Yeah. He was. I think he'd been at the Moroccan. That's right. And then he wanted to go to Dakar, and they did that. And anyway, he got there, and it hadn't healed. And so he um, he rode the first couple of days, realised it was pretty sore, and then um, I don't know if you saw any shots of him. He actually put instead of having the throttle off and then you winding it on, he put a rubber band around the throttle and had it full on. And he only touched it when he wanted to wind it off. So he rode nearly the whole of Dakar with a throttle wide open. <laughs> which He's is savage, eh? Extraordinary. Yeah, yeah. And and he won, you know, which is even more extraordinary. Yeah. And um yeah, and, and then What he kind came, of pain do you think he would have been riding through? Oh, it would have been pretty bloody sore. Yeah. 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 It would have like when he had to use it to yeah. to slow down. Seems an odd concept, isn't it? You lose using your, your hand and the throttle slow to slow down. down. But um, when he used it at the side, it wouldn't have been nice. It would have been pretty uncomfortable. So when he got back to us, what had happened, if you if you go back a slide, there might be a picture of one in a scaphoid somewhere. Uh, I think go down, go down, Griff. I think it's that one. Is yeah, that? so if you look at that, so they fi- that's them firing a couple of guide oh, that's wires a vi- in. That's a video. Pl- so, click on that and we'll watch it. Yeah, so that's them trying to do what we just talked about. So doing a... So getting it as reduced as you can, putting a wire over it, you then take a uh, essentially an X-ray. It's an image intensifier, um, like you get a real-time X-ray. Oh, so that's what that pin's for. That w- they've put one in to stabilise it, one in to put the screw over, and oh, then they'll run yeah. a drill down, and then so they've measured the length. Wow. And so this is very similar to a surgery that you would do. Yeah, we do. We do lots of these. Yep. Yeah. 
So it's uh, you then so pre-drill. I know about that from yeah. uh, building this here table. Yep, and that's and that's what they call an Acumed screw. That's a progressive change. So see how the thread gets progressively uh, narrow yep, as you come yep, up. Yeah, I personally don't use that, but that's that's you know it's perfectly Similar good headless concept. bone screw. It's same concept. Yeah, exactly the same concept. And so as you're advancing it, it's hopefully squeezing the fracture together. Yeah, right. Now it will only squeeze squeeze you say a millimeter. If you're open by more than a millimetre, it still won't get you into contact. And that's uh, probably what, what largely happened. happened. Yeah, okay. What you need is pre-compression. So you need to get it together and then, and then use that to really give the squeeze, if that uh, makes yes, sense. Yes, it makes perfect sense, yeah. And, and so, Toby... You're, d- you're just was, a body, You're just a carpenter. <laughs> Basically, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Bone yeah, carpenter. It broke, me fix. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So... I just um, fully, like, reduced your profession down. Sorry, yeah, it's mate. okay. No, no, We're didn't happy me, with didn't that. Mean <laughs> that. Didn't mean that, didn't mean it. And... Uh, but of course, when it hadn't held, by the time he got back, the the distal end of the screw, the proximal end still had decent bite. The distal end had been windscreen wipering inside oh. the scaphoid, so it was completely hollow. So there was nothing in there. Fuck. So it was just rattling. And then you can't run no more gaps in that. Well, well, we did. We've managed to really? find just enough bone to to um, had to change the angle of the screw completely and yep. put it down and try and find bone at both ends and make it stable. And then um, once we were thought we had the right trajectory what we did was take a lot of bone out of his hip and pack it into the to the end of the so bone how do you, and how craft do you take it. that bone out oh look these days they've got great instruments like little cores and you can actually it's like a little spinning shaver that just goes down inside the pelvis so you make a little hole in the top of your crest of your pelvis and and you use a drill to so take a it out bone auger kind of thing basically it does it looks a bit like a bone auger wow um old-fashioned way was to actually and we still sometimes do this when we want bigger volumes of bone and things but you can actually just cut the top off the, your crest of your pelvis open it up and take it all that scoop all of that bone out of the inside and then so put how it back hard on. is bone on the inside so you, you uh, did the outside layer like, the hardest yeah it's a bit like honeycomb sort of really yeah, crunchy so, it's not, honeycomb. so it's not that hard oh uh, it's all in very fine trabeculae so yeah. you can you can get a little curette and scrape it out and wow hmm. It's 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 designed to res- resist load in a direction, you know. So if you lean on it, yes, it would resist a fair bit of force. But if you're actually scraping it out, it's like you're scraping across all of that, and it just it comes out pretty easily. And so, how hard is like that outer layer of a bone? Um, probably not as hard as you think. Like, yes, it's hard, but it's not. Um, bone is not a totally rigid structure. It's got flex in it, and it's got you know. So it, it's not as hard as you th- you think it's going to be. Yeah, okay. Yeah, because um, I guess you have this picture in your mind. Being rock hard. Yeah, like a, like, like a, Yeah, like the Wolverine or something. But, yeah, it's not like... <laughs> It's uh, it's it's softer than that. It's got it's got a modulus of elasticity that you know has some flex in it and yeah. and um, yeah. So it it's um, and that's why they fail the way they do too. You know, when mm. when a, you get a fracture, it's it's to do with that structure. Mm. So um, so yeah, when you scrape it out, you can pack it into that end, and then we got enough bite and it healed well. You know. Toby's a, a smart guy. Like he, he actually, he came home from there saying, "I think my scaphoid's stuffed. I need a full corner fusion." Really? So he'd obviously spoken to people, looked at it, he, you know, and he came home. And I said, "Oh, I so think- you guys were able to save that for him, basically?" Yeah, we said, "No, just give us one go at fixing it because I reckon we can get it healed." So, and it look, partly luck, but yeah, we've done a good job and it's worked. And he's he's got a good scaphoid and he's got a good wrist now that will last a lot longer than if we had gone down that path of a four corner for him so yeah you can't go back from that once it is what it is yeah yeah Yeah. so that's incredible so so those sort of things are challenging you get some big injuries obviously from from motocross you know you get fractured humerus and yeah some of those wrist fractures they get are really quite nasty you know where they shear the the end of it yeah compound fractures and and when they've really sheared the end off and they're a challenge because you don't have much to fire a screw or a wire into it's a usually an often or often a very thin bit of bone there yeah so that can be challenging um you get some you get some gnarly stories you know from the guys too that that some of them are tough like they're really yeah. tough guys um we saw uh we looked after ben Grabham one year um after fink yeah and um he, he was he was riding with toby and the KTM team and they went out and say about halfway down the track on the first day he hit something came off and he said he stood up 
and knew the wrist was not right. You know, he could see that it was bent and and he, he was trying to reduce it himself when Toby came past and he said, no, you keep going, mate, I'll, I'll fix this up. And um, he said he couldn't get it in. Like he was pulling on it and pulling on it. He couldn't get his wrist to sit on the end of his forearm. Yeah. And uh, so he... Um, he was telling me the only way he could think to get it reduced was to try and jam his hand into the frame of the motorbike and then lift the motorbike up and throw it oh. to get the weight to clunk it back in. It yeah. did work, so he got it back in. Fuck. And then he chopped the back fender off the bike and stuffed it down the back of the glove and put duct tape over it and hold it there, and he took off. Whoa. And, and he won that year. Rode the rest Whoa. of that day and the whole next day with it like that and came in and had a win, so... That is savage. Yeah, yeah, they're tough guys. So it's uh, it's interesting looking after them because they don't they don't tell you they're sore. They just sit there and look at you most of the time. So that is gnarly, dude. Yeah, yeah, yeah. wow. That's uh, yeah. Some of them have just got a different gear. Like I mean, I I remember yeah, Toby coming back from that Dakar. We obviously knew that he was injured. I don't know that he told many people um, how bad that was, but. Yeah, you think to race the gnarliest off-road race in the world with a broken wrist, and yeah. then you know, then you got a guy like Grabo that's doing it, like just something different, eh? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, they, they just get up and go again. It's not; it can't be easy. <laughs> <laughs> not, not for everyone. <laughs> no, I don't think I've got that in me. No, nah, no. Nah. Is there is there something that uh, people can do to make their bones healthier? Like, is this? Do you think that supplementation works? Is there diet stuff that you can do? Like, um, or is it just super deep genetically that it's just not something you can influence? Because the, the, the old like drink your milk kind of thing. Yeah, it, it, certainly. If you're not getting enough calcium and vitamin D, then taking more will help. But if you're getting a good diet and plenty of sunlight, and you've got enough vitamin D and you've got enough sunlight in your diet. There's no evidence that taking more helps. Mm. So, um, if you're deficient, yes, there are things you can do. You can load it. You can you can take vitamin D. You can take take um, calcium. If you've got a normal intake and you're exercising, and you, can you make your bones super strong? Not really, because bones adapt to take the load that you're putting through them. It's a thing you know called Wolf's Law, in that your bone will. Um, it's like if you put a plate on a bone. The, the, the load is shared between the plate and the bone. Yeah. When you take the plate off, that the bone, bone takes... Weaker. It, it is slightly weaker for a yeah. while and there's a small increased risk of fracturing. But when you load it normally, when you walk on it, you play sport, whatever it might be, that load will stimulate that bone to lay down enough bone that it resists the force that you're putting through it. Yeah. So, but can you get it to lay down extra bone... Not That's, that I'm aware of. Yeah, that'll be where the genetic component comes into it. Because, mm. yeah, I mean, there was a period of time where me and Maddie were kids and I think I I broke my wrist. I can't remember how I broke it first. I broke my wrist and then I had to cast the six-week cast. I didn't need surgery. It was just a fracture as a kid. I think it was like on, it was just an yeah. ulnar or whatever. And then had a cast. I got my cast off went back to school after getting my cast off played a game of footy and then i slid on the ground and then there was like a tree like it was kind of like what the corner of the field you know mm. and I like slid in for a try and had my arm out and then hit the tree exactly where my wrist was broken and then i rebroke it again and then maddie uh when maddie did his ankle real bad i broke my ankle at the same time and they were all like it was all in a kind of a period of like a year or so mm. and um everyone's telling mum oh the boys have got weak bones and they, and they got milk, this they and they, yeah, yogurt, yeah, they yeah. <laughs> is there any truth to any of that stuff no only, only if you're deficient yeah you know? okay. yeah so um it doesn't make your fractures heal any quicker yeah um it, it only helps if you're not getting enough so if you're actually haven't got a good diet you drink you you know you, you get your dairy you, you you get enough sunlight um, and you do need a fair amount of sunlight. I, I, I think the diagnosis of vitamin D deficiency, from what I can gather, is becoming more and more common. Yeah, They're realizing yeah. there's actually a lot of people who don't get enough sunlight. I probably would be one of them because we it's sit a, in here it's a dark all room. The time. Yeah, 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 yeah. Although you spend your weekends outside yeah. and you're riding oh, bikes. And do you know how much like sunlight you should be exposed no. to a week? No, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Oh, Griff, you should type that in. How much sunlight does a human need a week? 
be interesting to know if, uh, what the ballpark is. It'd be hard to tell. It, it, pro- true, it probably guess. depends very much where you are on the on the planet too. You know, yeah, like yeah. you know, an hour outside. You know, in it'd Australia, be equator is probably, probably quite yeah. different to an hour outside in the Arctic Circle. Of, yeah, you know, yeah, that's so. true too. Be interesting if there's like a uh, just a general heuristic that you could follow. Yeah, there you go. Uh, to make this is just off Google at healthline.com regular sun exposure is the most natural way to get enough vitamin D to maintain healthy blood levels aim to get 10 to 30 minutes of midday sunlight several times per week people with dark skin may need a little more than this 10 to 30 minutes a day Hmm. I don't know if I get enough it may not yeah yeah I wonder if there's like a compounding effect of if you spend eight hours in the sun on the weekend, if it like yeah, how how regular yeah because yeah, yeah, like, you might that. not be able to absorb as as much every day. You know what I mean? Yeah, like yeah. so, if you take it's like electrolytes, you could just take bulk electrolytes, but at a certain point, your body's just going to piss them out because there's only yeah. so much that you can absorb. Yeah, and, and that's what happens with a lot of people that take multivitamins and things. They're really useful if you're deficient in something. Yeah, if you're not and you've got a great diet and and you're getting adequate intake of everything, it just it just goes out in the loo. Is there so, a way to know your bone density? Or like, is there an easy test that, that yeah, you, you gets can have, done? You can have your bone density uh, measured. It requires a, a particular um, technique. You can't just have a normal x-ray. Yeah. If you have a normal x-ray, you can sometimes look and go, gee, those you look a bit osteopenic there. So, yeah. But that also depends on the amount of radiation they use to take the x-ray. Uh, so if they wind that up, yeah. you look less dense. And yeah, yeah, yeah. So you have to have... a a standard technique for, yep. for assessing bone density. Yep. And what they do is x-ray particular bones with um, – um, generally they'll do um, dual levels and so and there's charts and they can tell you how much bone you're in and compare it to your age and sex and where you lie on a bell curve of yep. of how much bone quality you've got. And that's what they do um, with most elderly people at some stage, especially if you have a fracture that's typical of a – osteoporotic fracture yeah they'll refer you to have that test done and see where you lie and if you lie below a certain point then they'll recommend treatment which might be you know um uh there are some factors that um uh, um, drugs that will inhibit the um the osteoclast from resorbing bone and so they'll let you accumulate some bone yeah so they can put you on those they can um put uh, a lot of the um females go into hormone replacement therapy yep. to try and preserve what bone they've got so slow down the resorption yeah and so there's things you can do to help yeah no that's super interesting <coughs> so uh another injury that i wanted to talk about was chucky's recent one yeah how bad was that because that was a very bad crash yeah look um <coughs> pardon me it, it's um look that was a bit tricky that one in that um he had a very comminuted olecranon fracture. So olecranon's the the tip of your ulna, so the pointy bit at the at your elbow. That oh, so articulates. your elbow so, is just your ulna bone, basically. Well, the, the tip of it is, yeah, yeah, yeah. So and that's articulating around your humerus, and and he'd obviously struck something quite hard with that. So he had the sort of fracture where he'd driven his humerus into the olecranon and. Um, had a comminuted fracture of all the articular pieces, so all the joint surface that articulates with your humerus, <coughs> and then and then, then the whole olecranon would then come off as a as a piece as well. Um, and, and look, I, I he he had some surgery over in in um, Saudi. Not the best. Oh no 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 is the answer to that they hadn't really done a great job. Oh, it's so and, scary that you like. Does he have? Would he have had to have got that surgery before he flew, or could you basically just be like, "Don't touch me, I'm going home." Uh, look in the in the situation, you've got to trust what the, the guy looking after is telling you, and the doctor's telling you. And they oh, told him he had I'd to have find it there. It's so hard to trust um, those people. Yeah, and Not, look, he, he as it was, they they told him he should have it done before he came. And they did some surgery, and then he was on his way home. But before he came, they sent his X rays to you know his his team of people in Melbourne and um, uh, one of the physios he works with down there, Tim Cole, who... who yeah, I know Tim you well. Know, Tim, yeah, 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 great guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 He, he, he did a long time. Like, we used to be on race safe together. Yeah, yeah. yeah, we used to do a lot of the races and things. And and Tim actually, he must have shown someone the x-ray down there who went, that's bad, and he sent the x-ray. He actually called me and said, look, can I send you an x-ray of, of Chucky and we'll have a look? So he sent it through... And unfortunately, what they'd done 
Um, when it had fractured, it had spat out a lot of the articular pieces, so the cartilage-covered pieces that had formed your joint surface. Yeah. And they'd thrown a lot of them out, <laughs> which is bad part news. of the problem. Bad a lot, news, a lot of them were missing, yeah. And then the uh, what they'd done was line up the outside shell, so the bit that's on the under the skin, and they'd wired that together really quite well. It looked great from the outside. But the problem was there was no inside and yeah. there was no articular surface. So instead of it being like this and, and wrapping around um, the humerus, the humerus had descended into the bone and was actually sitting on the outer cortex, not the inner cortex, if you know what I mean. Like it had actually, yeah, there yeah, was nothing yeah. there to support it. Yeah. So he couldn't leave it like that. He would never have been able to move his elbow. So um, we, we really just had to take him back to theatre and try again. So we, we took him back. We took but all the metal work pieces. out with le- with some of the pieces missing. So that's like doing a jigsaw with, with someone's hidden seven of the pieces. You know, yeah. you're trying to go, oh, God, you know. So you've got to open it up and, and almost turn it inside out. We found a few of the articular pieces had actually been pushed down inside the ulna. So you could, so we could actually a couple pick of them. them out. Um, <laughs> That's so gnarly. And there were a couple there we could elevate. And, and between that, we probably found about half of his joint surface. Um, so we pieced that together and sort of made it, like used the humerus as a template. And then we got some of his bone from his hip, same process, and some bone putty, which is like a demineralized um, sort of... Uh, um, it's like putty, and it's 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 made up of bone components, so it's a bit tacky. Yeah, and you can and you can use that to um, sort of mix with the bone graft, so it's all a bit. You can mold it almost like a bit of plasticine, almost not quite, but yeah, you can yeah. make it into a shape. And so what we did was um, got the articular pieces we could get together, then reduce the ulna again the way they'd put the outside part back together, and then what you've got to try and do is get wires through it. It, there was no plate that was going to hold it. It was just yeah. too mushed. So we had to get some wires through it. Um, and you've got to sit them as close to those articular fragments. And, and, and they call it rafting. You know, so you actually put pins. So if, if you're oh, trying to yeah, support yeah. these pieces, you put the pins really sitting on yeah. the back side of them yeah. so they can't move. Yeah. And, and then fill the hole. So then there was a big hole. We filled all that up with the putty. And then put two tension bands on. So as you figure of eight wires, so as you twist them, it squeezes it all together. Yeah. Um, and we essentially tried to build him a new articular surface. So um, it's done well, really well. He looks. You've seen him riding. I was going to say, yeah. And then he goes and posts uh, riding this weekend, and yeah, it seems like you did an all right job. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's actually going extremely well. So we've we've taken the wires out since because it was. He, want, he wants to get ready for Dakar for next year. So once it all united, we've removed the wires and he's going really well. How hard do you, would he have had to hit the ground to cause that kind of damage? Oh, it clearly had a fair bit of force behind it. Like there was, it was chattered, like there was yeah. lots of little pieces. Um, it's amazing that that's the only thing he broke. Well, he, he had that airbag on. Yeah, right. Yeah, have you heard about that? No, I haven't. I haven't seen the footage. Is there any? There's, there's probably is no footage. I don't is there? think there is footage no. of it. No. Have you seen those airbags go off? I've seen the airbags go off. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So he, it was one of the. Um, he's one of the first guys. I think the Dakar the last couple of years has done it, but it's very new technology in the off road. Um, yeah. Well, they've had it in road racing for a while now. Yep. Um, but I guess the algorithm's a little bit different. Um, because there's a lot more going on on a motocross or an off-road. Yeah, you um, wouldn't want to be riding over some whoops and... Uh, and it go off. And go off, yeah, yeah. Yeah, So, yeah, Chucky actually, the vet, basically that vest had, um, had inflated when he'd hit the ground. So, yeah. yeah, like if you ask him, he said he would be dead 100% Without it. if you didn't. Yeah. And, um, yeah, like it's crazy, crazy piece of technology. Yeah, yeah, it's great, isn't it? Mm, it's going to save a lot of lives. And yeah, like he, he definitely thinks that he would have died without that. So when you say it's amazing that he only had that, that's probably why. Yeah, it uh, probably is. Yeah, he's got he's got a flight really. So, But um, but while he was recovering from that, we, we, we did some more surgery on him to stabilise his shoulder because it would be unstable for a long time. So, oh, really? So he's had both done. Right, rotator cuff? No, no, he's had a... Um, uh, a, a stabilization so for his glenohumeral joint so he had 
um, you know, dislocating shoulder that oh, used to come out. Yep, so, yep. yeah, we've we've put a bit of bone on the front and and uh, repaired his labrum and everything. So, he's going well from that too. <laughs> crazy! It's crazy yeah. what what you uh, what you can do. Yeah. Oh, look, it's it's good stuff. It, it's great treating these guys too because they're so motivated. I mean, yeah. you, you do occasionally have to try and slow them down a little bit. Mm. Um, but uh, it, it's it's. It's really nice, you know, to see guys that are so keen. Yeah. Uh, I think of of all the sportsmen I treat, they're probably the ones that are the most driven to get back. Yeah. They just want to get back on the bike and ride. Like, whereas a lot of the other guys are, yeah, yeah I'll take my time and I'll, you know, get back. And the the, the, the riders are, they're on it. They want it. They, they, like, I'll often operate them and I see them the next morning and they say, can I ride the surf? And I say, no, you can't <laughs> ride the surf. So. And, and um, but they're just super keen, yeah. you know, and, and they're motivated and then they come back um, miles ahead of where they should be on their rehab. You know, you say, oh, have you got, you know, he's telling me aiming for 10 degrees of external rotation, they come back with 80, you know. Yeah, they, yeah. You go, you, you slow down a little bit and so... But that's that's a nice problem. Yeah, yeah. Well, mate, we just did our three hours. I'm, wow. Uh, yeah, told you to go quick. Yeah. I'm uh, very appreciative of you coming in. I hope you enjoyed it. I learned a lot and, um, yeah, really cool to just hear about, you know, some of the things that you can do and uh, the experience that you've had. And, yeah, you, like I said, you've been a, a, a really big part of the Australian motocross community um you know since you met troy in 06 07 um you've helped a lot of guys and uh and then it think in turn that helps a lot of fans and the sport and the industry in australia so uh i really appreciate that and uh i appreciate you coming on and, and hanging out and talking with us Man, it's my my absolute pleasure it's uh it's a great a great program and and um it's just so far from what we normally do it's a it's uh it's it's like I was I'm significantly more nervous about coming on here today than <laughs> than doing a big surgery. So just because <laughs> nah, it's, it's out of your comfort yeah, zone. Yeah, yeah, just yeah. out of your wheelhouse. But no, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. It's been really cool and to yeah to see some of the you know the things that you can do with the the different you know artificial ligaments and the i guess the new technologies that are that are coming out and um yeah maybe there's like a, an ethetist or something that we could get on at some hey, point. we can, like we can yeah some we can. cool stuff because oh, yeah it's super interesting yeah it is and it, and it's it's i think in the long run it's good for listeners to have a a bit of an idea of those things because mm. they um if they understand it they know you know they'll often ask the right questions yeah if you know what i mean like they'll yeah. come in half armed you know to 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 um they understand what the process is going to be they understand what you know they, they may not know exactly what their shoulder involves but they know the factors that are involved yeah, yeah. and and the fact that you you know you there's a lot of things go into making the decisions about you know you need to decide what sort of anesthetic you have us so so yeah. what sort of implant you need and yeah. and then hopefully doing it to the best of our ability and making it right yeah no well, i hope i never have to see you in a professional <laughs> sense but you're an awesome bloke and i love uh, any time i get to talk to you so really appreciate it mate my pleasure thank you no worries mate if you enjoyed this content, please like and subscribe. And to listen to the full three-hour podcast, search Gypsy Tales in your favorite podcast platform or click the link in the description below. Gypsy Gang.